missing our court reporter for starters. Shh. Back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter, all parties are again present. Mr. Simpson is present with his counsel, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Cochran, Mr. Sheck, Mr. Blazier, people represented by Mr. Darden, Mr. Goldberg, Mr. Clark. The jury is not present. Uh, the record should reflect that this morning the court had a conference with counsel in chambers concerning certain demonstrative evidence items prepared by the uh, prosecution. The first was the uh, LAPD additional evidence disposition, which has been previously marked as People's 209. Court will allow the use without commentary regarding what was done with the uh, items represented, which are the substrate controls. Uh, while they were in the possession of the uh, defense and made available at that time for their um, examination. There is a second board that is entitled Defense Testing, and I'm sustaining the defense objection to the title of that uh, board. And for simpli simplicity purposes, Mr. Goldberg, I would suggest at this point that we mark that as People's 210. Is that agreeable to the people? Yes, sir. And I'm going to uh, direct Mr. Fairlow to uh, cover the uh, title of the board as defense testing, since at this point it's not appropriate to comment on whether or not any testing has been accomplished or uh, done by the uh, defense. Yeah, Your Honor, is the court going to uh, have a stipulation prepared? Or will we be able to ask Mr. Madison whether these items were turned over in October of last year? That's You'll be able to ask him if those items were turned over and that they were returned at some point in time, and that's it. I believe you used the word examination when in chambers we used the word inspection. Inspection. Thank you. All right. And Mr. Matheson is here, and Mr. Goldberg, you can consult with him on that. All right, as to a third board that was shown to the court, which has various depictions of uh, item 13, the socks, the court will sustain the defense objection at this time to the board itself. However, the photograph of the single sock, um, the objection is overruled. All right, anything else we need to put on the record before we invite the jurors to rejoin us? Mr. Goldberg? No. All right, let's have the jury. Seated. Let the record reflect that we've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. All right. 
Mr. Gregory Matheson, would you resume the witness stand, please? Mr. Matheson is again on the witness stand, undergoing direct examination by Mr. Goldberg. Good morning, Mr. Matheson. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Matheson, you were reminded, sir, you are still under oath. Mr. Goldberg, you may continue with your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Matheson. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Matheson, when we left off yesterday, we were talking about the creation of uh, FITSCO cards from the reference files. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Right. I wanted to uh, show you what we previously marked as 163L for identification. See if you can tell us what this type of item is. This is an example of a type of, of blood swatch card that we purchase. Uh, it has an outer envelope for protection inside, contains an area where you could record some information about the items, and then four circles that are in a filter type paper, approximately an inch in diameter where you put the blood. Can you hold that up so the jurors can see what you're talking about? 1492 indicates you can't see that. <laughs> Do you want to pass that through the jury box? Sure. I also passed the envelope. That yes. Mark another exhibit while the jurors are. Yes. I'd like to mark as people's two one, excuse me, two eleven for identification. Uh, as two eleven A, what appears to be a photograph of body number sixty. I don't. I'm sorry. That was item number sixteen. Sixteen. <coughs> Six zero. As 211B, what appears to be item number 59. All right, and 211B. 211C, what appears to be item number uh, 17. The Fitzco cards. I placed the uh, numbers on the revere, reverse of the photographs. All right. All right, Deputy Russell, would you turn that to uh, Mr. Goldberg? All right, thank you, Council. Proceed. Mr. Matheson, I'd now like to show you the photographs that have been marked as People's 211A through C for identification. Is the resolution uh, high enough for you to see those on your screen? I could see the the items and what's displayed there. The writing is difficult to discern. Did, did you take a look at these photographs prior to uh, coming into court today, last night? Yes, I did. All right. And with respect to uh, these three items, what are they, first of all? 
All three items are cards similar to the type that was just displayed uh, in the courtroom here that are used to preserve liquid blood samples. Portions of a liquid sample is applied to the four different squares of the card. The uh, best way to preserve a sample is dried and frozen, so that way we have portions of the blood rather than just keeping it in a vial in the best possible form. Do you do your testing or some of your testing from these cards as opposed to the blood vials themselves? As far as the conventional typing goes, it's all done directly from the blood vial. These we started using in our laboratory uh, with the advent of DNA typing. All right. Now, in, in uh, many of the photographs that we've seen of the packaging materials in this case, there are these cards at the bottom. What are those? The ones that have the DR number and the date. Those cards are placed in there by the photographer. They have the DR number, date, and what's called a C number, which references it back to the order number for the photography. Is that something that's standard uh, when your SID photographer is taking photographs uh, such as these? Well, it's standard for something like that to show up in at least one frame of a roll of film or a sequence of uh, photographs regarding the evidence. Okay. and. Uh, with respect to the photograph that's 211A, on the bindle there are some initials, if you can see them, that are, that are CY. Can you see that? No, I can't make it out on the, Maybe I'll show you the picture. OK. Who's that? The CY are the initials of Colin Yamauchi, a criminalist that works in the serology unit. And what is the C2? C2 refers to a designation that we gave the initial uh, exemplars that were involved in this case. Uh, it was decided that due to confidentiality, we would give a arbitrary indication, C1, C2, and C3, to the uh, exemplar or portions of the exemplars that were submitted to Cellmark Diagnostics for analysis. Is that something that's standard or was just done in this case? It was done in this case. We haven't done that before. And C2 then was uh, Nicole uh, Brown? Yes, it was. Who was C1? C1 was Mr. Simpson. And C. Yeah, on Noted. And C3? C3 is uh, Mr. Goldman's sample. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> now, I was also uh, going through the board that we marked as People's 177, the evidence disposition. Can I see the, the board that has number 78? Item number 78 on it. And I'd like to mark as my next exhibit. <clears throat> That's 212, a document that says serology item description notes. Well, Mr. Blake, do you have a copy of that? Need the easel over here. I'm going to place a 212 on the reverse of the document.
Sir, directing your attention to uh, People's 177, and this is the exhibit that has 59 through 82 on it. Looking at item number 78, the packaging, did you do some uh, testing yourself on that item? Yes, I did. Okay. And did you take some swatches from that item? Yes. What was that? What is the item? Well, the item, item number 78, are a pair of white shoes with red stains on them. Okay. Now, in reviewing the records in order to ver verify this board, um, did you see a record that pertains to uh, the entry 78 swatch and the date 72094 with Mr. Yamauchi's name? Yes, I did. The uh, name appears on the board here. I recognize the document as one prepared by him. Okay, can we see that next document is April's 212? Just to save time, show showing the people's 212 identification. Can you tell us what that is? This is a serology item description note page filled out by Mr. Yamauchi, uh, indicating the swatching or sampling of some stains under the what appears to be the left. Uh, shoe from item number 78. And you previously described this type of document. Is this type of document actually generated at the time that the actual analysis or swatching is being performed? Yes, it is. And you have sketches on these uh, very often, is that correct? Yes. And <coughs> does the analyst sketch out or try to sketch out where the swatch or cutting came from when they're taking a swatch or a cutting? Yes, normally. Right. Did Mr. Yamauchi do that here? Yes. It's a stain. Is there a sketch on this particular document indicating where the swatches came from? Yes, there is. All right. And I wanted to ask you another question about uh, the items that were recovered by you from uh, the carpet from the Bronco. That was People's 172. If we could see that board again. People's 172. <coughs> Sir, directing your attention back to a People's 172 for identification and the photograph in the middle on the bottom that has the number 293 in it. Do you recognize what's depicted there? Yes, I do. Do you know who is pointing uh, to that item um, with the red pen? I believe that's my hand. And when you collected this item 293, did you collect it from the carpet that's depicted in uh, that photograph? 
Yes, I did. And you've previously discussed how you did that. You used the method of just cutting rather than cloth swatch. That's correct. Now, what item number is the carpet itself? I believe it's item number 33. And that was recovered by uh, Mr. Fung, is that correct? Yes. Now, in terms of the swatching that was done on the <laughs> console of the Bronco, that you said that you could see prior to when you did your swatching, do you feel that more sample should have been taken from those areas, 30 and 31? Yes, I feel the problem. Sustain, for well, question. when they were initially swatched. Yes, I did. Upon seeing the blood that was present, I, I believe that probably should, more should have been taken originally. And what do you mean by that? Well, there was uh, stains present on the console, and uh, that's a hard surface. It's a non porous surface. The blood is just sitting right on top. It's fairly easy to remove, but it also can be fairly thin. I would have, uh, probably the best thing to have done would have been to have removed more of the sample originally on the first search. When you removed more sample from those locations, was all of it gone by the time you were finished? No, it was not. How much was left? Oh, I don't remember. But there was some left? There, there was visible staining left, yes. Uh, if, if you're removing staining that covers a fairly large area on a wall, for example, how do you decide how much of that stain to remove if, it, if it's a smear that covers maybe a square foot? Well, given the different types that are available to us now, I, I would... In a situation like that, would probably want to collect four or five swatches, you know, average maybe quarter inch square swatches, something like that. Uh, maybe, maybe a little more. It depends on whether there's other evidence available. But would you necessarily cover the whole square foot? No, I, I probably would not take it all. Okay. <laughs> all right, thank you. I'd like to mark as people's next in order the additional LAPD evidence disposition board. That's 213. Maybe Mr. Ferretlow can put that up for us while he's there. Oh, sorry. I think we previously marked this before yes, we started. It's 209. Nine. Sir, direct your attention to what's been previously marked as People's 209 for identification. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And have you had the opportunity to look at this uh, document to verify it against the records that are maintained by the Scientific Investigations Division? Yes, I did. Did you go through the same type of verification process that you described yesterday afternoon when I was asking you about the other evidence disposition boards? That's correct. Now, with respect to um, item number six, was a uh, control swatch of item number six sent somewhere on February 17th? Yes, it was. And what records did you have to look at in order to verify that? Well, there were a number of notes that were made by the individuals who prepared and sent those samples. Uh, okay. it ended up being many pages worth of notes. Were those notes that were prepared at the time that the samples were actually being uh, packaged for transmittal or, or shipping? Yes, they were. <laughs> now, in addition to the documentation procedures that you described just now and yesterday, was there any photo documentation that occurred? Yes. What was that? Well, prior to the items that were uh, shipped out or delivered out that uh, during those dates in February, 
all of the items were described and photographed prior to their release. And does the photograph that's in the cell under item number for number six uh, depict the photo documentation that was done? Yes, it does. But it's just... Now, in the bindle that's in item number six, uh, was there anything other than the control? No, there's not. And sir, where did these items that were uh, sent out on the 17th go to? to a laboratory in Albany, New York. Do you know who brought them there? They actually went out in a couple of different uh, shipments. I believe uh, DA investigators transported them. Okay. And when did these various items that went out on the 17th uh, come back? Well, they came back also in a couple of different shipments, but in and around February 22nd. Now, with respect to item number six, when it came back, or after it came back, was it photo documented again? Yes, it was. Can you give us the date that it was photo documented? You'd have to refer to the yeah. photograph. The date reflects February 27th, 1995. Now, on the date that it was uh, photo documented, were you um, notified by someone to come and look at that bindle? Yes, I was. And what did you do? Well, I was asked to come back to the serology unit to take a look at the contents of that bindle. What did you see? A portion of the control plus a hair. And is that depicted in the photo documentation that was done on the 27th? Yes. Perhaps we could, with the court's permission, just move this board down so that the jurors can see it. Yes. So, Mr. Matheson, as to item number six, was there a hair that was not there in the bindle when it was sent to the defense on February 17th, found in the bindle when it was photo documented on February the 27th? That's correct. Right. And what happened to uh, item number six, the control, after the 27th of February? I'm going to check your report briefly. Yes, Mr. Court Porter.
Thank you. Mr. Matheson, to your knowledge, was the purpose of the items that went out on February the 17th to allow the defense to inspect those items? That was my understanding, yes. Right. Now, after the 27th, as to item number six, what happened to that item? It was uh, sent to the Department of Justice. And on the uh, column that says back to SID, what does that mean? Well, that reference is when items are returned back to uh, our facility. And certain items on the, say, return to evidence control unit on 222.95, uh, item 656 6, and 305, is that correct? Yes, it is. And who did that? The actual return of those items? To the evidence control unit. I believe I did. I'd have to re reference my notes to be sure. Okay. And, and that, uh, maybe you can double check your notes. I have the notes on other items that were returned uh, on 222nd, having a difficult time locating these particular items. Well, can you tell from your other notes who returned those? Or, or can you? Well, there were items that were uh, returned by Mr. Raquel to ECU on the 22nd. Okay. That's all right. But when you reviewed this board initially, did you check some document to see that these particular items were returned to ECU on the 22nd? I, re I checked documents that were in a notebook at the DA's office. I did not bring all the notes that we have associated with, just okay. things that I was directly involved with. Now, with respect to the cell uh, on number six, where it says DOJ 228.95, does that reflect that the date that it went out? Yes. And the analyzed the uh, coin envelope on that particular cell is an original envelope or a transmittal envelope. I have to take a look at the picture. That particular envelope is one that was prepared by Mr. Yamauchi, not the original envelope. Now, with respect to number seven, did you go through the same verification process that you just described with respect to number six? Yes, I did. All right. And you also looked at the photographs to verify that they were, in fact, 
photographs that were prepared by the anal items that were prepared by the analyst that actually did the shipping. Yes. <clears throat> now, with respect to the items that are uh, numbered 12 and 49, let's say returned on 3995 from DOJ, did you verify that those were in fact returned on that date? Yes. And do you know who actually put them back in ECU? Not at this point, no. Okay, but, but at any rate, you did verify that, one of, that either yourself or one of your criminalists did that? That's correct. And what about the items that were returned on 11 13, and 305? Yes. Okay. You, you verified that those were in fact returned on that date and rebooked into ECU. But they were returned on that date. They were not uh, uh, rebooked into the unit or into ECU at that time. At that time. Where did they go? They were stored in the serology freezer. Okay. And with respect to uh, 305, was that one of the... Um, items that you removed from the Bronco? As item number 305, that's correct. Okay. And when it came back, it was rebooked as another item number? Yes. Why was that? That is a procedure that we had in place regarding evidence that was submitted to outside agencies for analysis. Whenever, as I described earlier, there are types of DNA analysis that we don't perform in our laboratory. So when we want that work done, we send it out to Cellmark Diagnostics for them to perform the testing. It was our policy that the items would be sent out to the laboratory, then what we received back from Cellmark would be rebooked as a new item. We would not necessarily go through it, but retain it in its sealed condition from that laboratory, create a new item number for it, and return it to our evidence control unit. So when 305 rebooked as 401, once it came back from uh, the Department of Justice, was sent out to the Department of Justice again on May the 9th, was it sent out under item number 401 or 305? Well, the, the date when it was sent back out is March the 9th. I'm sorry. Yeah, right. And it would have been sent out as 401, okay. referencing it back to 305. Okay. And did you also check the icons on these to see that it was just swatches that were sent out on 6, 7, 12, 49, 56, and 305? Yes, I did. And you looked at the transmittal envelopes that are uh, in the column that says to outside lab to verify those? Yes. Now, with respect to item number 13, there's an entry under... Uh, the date to defense, the column to defense on 216.95 at SID. What does that reference? That references a viewing of that item or an inspection of that item within our laboratory. It didn't actually get sent anywhere. So it didn't actually leave the laboratory on that particular, well, it didn't leave the laboratory to go to the defense on that date. That's correct. That's within the SID facility. And did it leave the uh, laboratory to go somewhere on 216? Yes, it did. Where? To the FBI. And as to item number 17, the envelope containing a vial of blood, was that entire envelope and blood vial sent somewhere on uh, April the 3rd? Yes, it was. And where was it sent? To the FBI. Okay, thank you. Now, on uh, June the 29th of last year, did you participate in an inventory that was done 
at the Los Angeles Police Department of certain of the evidence in this case? Yes, I did. And who was present during that inventory? That inventory was performed with myself, uh, Mr. Yamauchi was present, and Ms. Kessler. And did you look at the socks item number 13 bearing the DR number in this case during that inventory? Yes, I did. Was that the first time that you actually saw that item? That's correct. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to mark as people's next in order, I think it's 213, a page from the uh, inventory sheet of 629. Fine, focus that just a little more. Still a little bit out of focus. Can we see? Uh, can you see the area that says 13 socks? Yes, I can. And can you read what it says to the right of the socks? Is that navy blue slash black? I, I made out the black, and as soon as you mentioned the navy blue, that is what is written there at the slash. Okay. Whose handwriting is this? That's mine. Now, um, okay. If we can see the, the other end of this column, 13. Can we get a little bit more? Can we see the top of the document too? Now, sir, there are three columns that you can see in this frame. One is analysis performed. That's on the left as we're looking at the document now. Uh, what does that refer to? That was an area where we could record, record what type of work had been done on that item up to that date. And for item number 13, did you record anything in that column? No, I did not. Why not? Because nothing had been done with that item yet. And then there's a column that says uh, comments that's on the right as we're looking at this document. That's, what did, that's correct. And what's that for? Well, that was uh, any sort of comment, either a greater description of the item, uh, miscellaneous information about it, potentially what additional work we would be doing with that item. What did you write in that column? In quotes, I have dress socks to give me an indication that they are, you know, a thin dress style sock rather than a heavy athletic sock or something like that. Uh, I have the words blood search indicating that it's our intent uh, to do that at some point. And then I also have in parentheses, none obvious. Well, did you actually do a blood search on this day on, on the 29th? It's just a, a quick visual inspection of the item. So why did you say blood search to be done? Because that was not an analysis at that point. We opened them up, took a look at them, and uh, indicated that that's something that we'd someday be performing. Why did you want to perform one in the future? It seemed like a legitimate thing to do on that piece of, uh, of evidence. It was an item of clothing. I, the quick inspection that was done in the office was insufficient, particularly due to its color, and we were not there to do a scientific analysis. It was something that was planned. Well, shouldn't you be able to see blood if there was blood on there? It depends on uh, the color and the 
type of material it's on. How often in your experience as a serologist do you find blood on fabrics <coughs> based upon testing that you did not see with your eyes? Well, it happens occasionally. It's not a regular thing. You have to, the conditions have to be just right to make it difficult to see. What are those conditions? Most notably, uh, black materials, uh, like a black leather jacket, very difficult to see blood on, uh, black denim, Levi's, that type of thing, difficult to see blood on, and uh, black material. I'd like to mark as people's next in order a photograph uh, depicting one that says sock A on the reverse, and it has a, a little <coughs> writing up in the upper right hand corner that says 13A as right. people's two. 14. 14. Can I make that 214A? Yes. Since it's sake. And Mr. Blazer, you've seen that? All right. And as 214B, uh, what appears to be another sock, and it has various writing. Just for identification purposes, the, the writing contains the numbers 42. C, B, various other writing. All right, 214B. Proceed. Thank you. So showing you people's 214A for identification. Maybe we can get a, a zoom in on the area with the writing near the heel. Hey, do you recognize uh, this item? Yes, I do. And is there anything on it that you placed on the item? Yes. What? That whitish notation that's directly on the sock itself. There's a arrow that points, I was going to say left, now down. <laughs> and now upside down, adjacent to the, to the left of the arrow, is the designation 15A, or excuse me, 13A. It's very hard to write on material with a, a pen, ink what, pen. What number A? 13A. Okay. And did someone take a cutting from that area? Yes. Who did that? I did. All right. Now, did you do that on some date after 629? Yes. <clears throat> Direct your attention to the date of uh, September the 18th. Can you take a look at your notes pertaining to that date and see whether you did any work on the sock? I'm referring to analyzed evidence report and associated notes. In particular, L371, 372, 373, and then L, partially cut off, it looks like 385. Now, sir, what date did you look at this uh, for the purposes of commencing the testing that you performed? On September 18th, 1994. When was the cutting 13A made? 
on that same date, I believe. And when you saw this sock on the um, September the 18th, at that time, did you see anything that stood out and you recognized as being blood? Well, initially, upon sustain. What did you see? Well, initially, upon removing the socks from the bag, basically, I was looking at the same thing as what I'd seen on the 29th. Upon closer examination with different lighting, I was able to discern that there were some stained areas on the sock. Okay, now when you say that initially, before you used different lighting, you pulled it out and you saw the same thing as on the 29th, what same thing? Well, the fact that they were black socks that did not have large obvious stains on them. And then when you say that you took a closer look with different lighting, what did you see? I was able to discern that there were stained areas on the socks. And can you describe what these stained areas looked like? They really just look like a, a darker area of, of the sock themselves. Was one of these stained areas in the area 13A? Yes. But we can't see it on the photograph? Or can That's we? correct. Let's try to get a little closer to see if we can see anything. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see anything now. I, I, I can't make anything out. Maybe you, can you see anything on there? As far as a visible stain? Yeah. No, I cannot. Okay. And uh, how long did you have to search when you were looking at it on the 18th before you could actually see something visibly? Oh, it was probably once I had them spread out and was down looking at them initially, I would say I started seeing something within a matter of a minute or two. The thing is, is as you get to look at it and you're, as your eyes become accustomed to what you're looking for, it became apparent that there were uh, other stains on the socks. Now, at that time, could you tell, based upon your training and experience, what you were looking at? Just by looking at the sock? Yes. At that point, I just had a, a darkened area. I didn't know what it was. So you could not tell for sure that, well, did you form an opinion that it was blood, or, or was it just you didn't know? Objection. It's a stain. Did you form any opinions at that time as to what the stain was that you were looking at? No, I did not. Okay. Now maybe we can see the um, other sock that's been marked as People's 113B, I think. 213. I'm sorry, it's 214B. 214A and B. This is 214B. Right. We see the was that the whole photograph? Okay. Sir, direct your attention now to, to uh, people's 214B for identification. Does that represent a photograph of one of the other socks as number 13? That appears to be a uh, black sock, like number 13. Okay. Now, when you saw this particular black sock or the other black sock, did you see any obvious staining on that? None obvious, no. And did you see any upon further examination? Yes, I did. What did you see upon further examination? Same thing. There were some small kind of darker areas on it that, as you allow your eyes to focus along with having seen the other one, started becoming apparent. Were they similar to the stains that you saw in the other sock? Well, similar in general appearance, not necessarily in size or location. That's what I meant. And at the time that you took a closer look and your eyes adjusted, did you form any opinion at that time as to what the stain was? No, I did not. All right, thank you. Now, 
in your experience, Mr. Matheson, what does dried blood look like? Kind of depends on what surface it's on, but as blood dries, it gets darker, going from a reddish to a more reddish brown, and eventually can look almost black. Do you know how long it would take uh, typically a dot of blood that's deposited outdoors on concrete, say, before it turns from a red to a brown? Sustained. Well, ha have you observed, ever had occasion to observe that a dot that was red and then later on turned brown? Yes. And how long, is that something that you could predict or does it depend on the circumstances, how long it takes? It depends on the circumstances. All right. But as it ages, it does change color. That's correct. And with respect to the stains that you've talked about on item number 13, what color were those, if you could detect any color? All I could see was they were a darker area on these dark socks. So could you see that they appeared to be black, red, um, brown or just darker? They were just darker. Now, directing your attention to the date of uh, June the 27th of last year, did you begin to do some uh, testing on that date on item number 18? Okay, I'm gonna again refer to my notes. 17, I'm sorry, in this case. Yes, I did. And that's the reference file? Item number 17, yes, the uh, whole blood vial marked O.J. Simpson. Now, when you started to do some testing, did you take anything out of the vial? Yes. What did you take? Blood. And how did you take it? I just take a, what's called a pipette, it's nothing more than a kind of a glass tube that comes down to almost a point. You have a rubber bulb on the top, insert that into the blood, draw out, oh, approximately a milliliter, which is not quite a teaspoon, something like that, and uh, transfer that into a, it's called a centrifuge tube, a small plastic tube that has a cone shape on the bottom. And you transfer it from the vial to the centrifuge tube with the uh, pipette? Yes. What do you do with the pipette after you made the transfer? Well, during the course of the analysis, normally the way I set up uh, my analysis on a whole blood vial like this, I have a what's called a test tube rack, which is nothing more than a plastic rack with a bunch of plastic prongs sticking up. The tube is placed down in there so it doesn't fall over. I place a clean uh, test tube alongside of it and then the centrifuge tube. When I'm not using the pipette, it just drops into the clean uh, test tube to hold it. Maybe I can show you Defense 1124 for identification again. Is this the same type of tube that the uh, reference sample is top tube? It's a purple top tube. I don't know if it's the exact same brand or not. Okay, but uh, that could be checked by looking at the photograph on our evidence disposition board? If it's visible in the photograph, okay. yes. Now, are these tubes, the purple top tubes that you work with in serology, graduated? No, there's no sort of indication of uh, the volumes. Graduated meaning that there's marks on it that show the different volumes. It's just a glass tube. Okay. Now, how much of the blood did you actually use in the testing that you commenced on uh, the 27th? I don't know exactly how much I used. Can you give us an estimation as to how much you typically use or is consumed in the testing itself? Uh, normally, there's no records kept as far as they use a small quantity. The approximate milliliter that I mentioned before, uh, I may use for all the testing, depending on whether I retain that centrifuge tube, return it to the blood vial, or whether I discard it. I could use anywhere from 
Oh, a small portion of that to the whole milliliter, milliliter and a half. Well, how much do you typically, is typically consumed in an ABO test, for example? Well, what's actually consumed for the test is about three drops of the cells and about three drops of the serum. So the test itself only requires a few drops? That's correct. So what do you do with the rest of the uh, item, that the, the blood that you put into the microcentrifuge tube? Actually, I've been inconsistent with that. Sometimes I've returned it back to the uh, blood vial, and sometimes I discard it. Do you know what you did in this case? No, I do not. Do you know what the uh, habit and custom is of other analysts in your laboratory who are working in serology? Well, within serology, uh, some retain them, some discard them. It's, uh, we're not consistent with that. So if you assume in a given case that you've poured out a milliliter of blood or pipetted out a milliliter of blood into a microcentrifuge tube and only three drops or so were used in the testing, and if you assume that you returned the remainder to the reference file, how much blood, if any, would be left on the pipetter and on the microcentrifuge tube? Whether you're going to have some clinging to the walls of both of those uh, approximation, maybe a quarter to a third of the original volume that you've pulled out. The blood's fairly viscous. It'll retain to the sides of the containers. Can you tell us in, in milliliters? Well, given that, I'd say about a quarter of a milliliter or so. Have you ever done any experiments or studies to try to figure out, uh, using the technique that you usually use, how much blood is thrown away uh, that was clinging to the sides of the microcentrifuge tube or the pipetter? No, we've never had to deal with an issue of needing to know that. Okay. Now, do you make any documentation at or around the time that this is performed uh, on the 27th to record specifically how much blood you used in the analysis or pipetted into the microcentrifuge tube? No. Why not? Because it's never been an issue. We've never had to worry about how much was used uh, during the course of the analysis. Why have you never had to worry about that? It's, it's never been raised an issue. We've never had to account for uh, every portion of blood that was supplied to us. It, in the, like I mentioned before, in the case of living individuals, we knew that we had a source to get additional sample if it was needed. It just has never been an issue before. So you don't have any written documents as to specifically whether you use the technique of uh, pouring the microcentrifuge tube back into the reference file or the technique of throwing the remainder away? That's correct. <clears throat> and do you make any recordation uh, when you see the vial on the 27th as to how much was in it when you started? I have done that in the past. I'd like to reference my notes to see okay. if I did in this case. by Mr. Yamauchi as to uh, how much he removed and used, uh, I did not. Well, I'm, I'm talking about the 27th when you did, when you did your, commenced your testing. No, I did not. And why don't you make any re recordation as to how much was in there when you started? Uh, for the same reason. It's never been an issue before. I didn't feel that that was information that needed to be recorded. So this has not come up previously in your uh, how many years of experience was it 17 at the Los Angeles Police Department? Well, I haven't been in serology that long, but uh, in my time in serology, I've never had to uh, provide this information before. Now, I'd like to uh, look back for a moment at the document that we marked, the inventory, which was People's 213 for identification.
And this is the same uh, page that we showed you before from 629? Yes. And on this page, did you write something out with respect to item number 17 as to how much was in the vial at that time? Yes, I did. What did you write? I recorded two, M two MLs, which stands for two milliliters. Now, how did you come up with that figure? It was an estimate. We opened up the envelope, uh, held up the tube, and, and made a guess or an estimate as to what percentage of the vial. So you didn't use any measuring technique in terms of a ruler or comparing it to another vial in order to come up with two milliliters? No, I did not. Now, in your experience in serology, do you have a lot of experience in dealing with these purple top tubes, estimating or guesstimating how much is in them? Well, in that, no, I don't. I, I know the total volume of it, and that's what I based my guess on, but it's not something that we do on a regular basis. And, you know, I don't have a lot of experience estimating the quantity. Well, well, one would think that over the 13 years, seeing these tubes over and over again, you kind of get a sense of what two milliliters looks like as opposed to three milliliters. Is that not true? Well, you'd get a sense if you measured it. The way you get experience, the way you learn something is by doing it. And uh, like I said, it, we have not measured the quantity of blood in vials as on a regular basis within the laboratory. So uh, when you looked at occasion, did you have occasion to look at this file again for the purposes of actually measuring it after the 29th? Yes, I did. <clears throat> And directing your attention to a September, excuse me, September, excuse me, uh, January the 4th of 1995. No, wait a minute. I'm sorry, September the 21st of 1994. Did you uh, take a look at the vial again? We're referring again to my notes. And a uh, chronology page labeled L521 for 921.94. Yes, I did. And did you measure it on that occasion? Yes, I did. How did you measure it? At that point, what I did is took a blood vial of similar shape and size, but empty, placing it alongside of the blood vial, item number 17, filled up the empty vial with water to visually the same level as the other one, and then measured the quantity of water that was equivalent to the amount of blood. How many times in the past have you done that procedure? Oh, I've probably just done it a couple of times. It is not a common situation. Do you know how long ago it was prior to September the uh, 21st that you had last done that procedure? No, I do not. Okay. But you think you've only done it a couple of times before that? Yeah, I don't remember any specific instance, but the, the fact that I figured out that that's how to do it in this case, I would assume that at some point I must have uh, done it before. Now, when you did that, how much was in it? I determined to be present in the blood vial along with the centrifuge tube that was also in the package for there to be 3.8 or approximately 3.8 milliliters of blood. So when you saw it on the uh, 29th during the inventory of June, of June you said that there was uh, two milliliters, and then when you saw it again on the 21st of September, you said that there was 3.8. That's, so, that's correct. So there's a 1.8 milliliter difference? Yes. And do you think that you could be 1.8 milliliters off in making a guesstimate as to how much was in the tube? Yeah. Why don't you rephrase the question? 
Well, how accurate do you believe you are in making a guesstimate as to something in one of these uh, purple top tubes? Objection. Sustained. Rephrase the question. How accurate do you think you are in estimating what's in one of those tubes? Obviously not very. I was far off. Okay. And how do you know that the 3.8 was accurate? Well, because that I used a tech, I used a legitimate technique to actually measure it as opposed to just holding a vial up and eyeballing it. Okay. And that was the technique of filling the other vial up with water? That's correct. Do you have any idea what the margin of error is in that technique? In that technique, I would say it's probably uh, fairly small. I, that's why I said approximately 3.8 milliliters. My guess is, is that the error on that would be less than 0.1 or 0.2 milliliters. Okay. Oh, well. All right. <clears throat> Now, had you ever seen anyone else measure that vial in your presence? No. I'm not talking about by the test tube method, but by any other method. Not that I recall. Now, on the same date, on September the twenty-nine, September the twenty-first, rather, did you also measure the contents of the vial number sixty and also fifty-nine? Yes, I did. And did you use the same technique? The technique involving equivalent amount of water. Yes. Can you give us the uh, measurements on those two? Yes. For item number fifty-nine, the blood vial, I found seven, approximately seven point two milliliters of blood. And for item number 60, approximately 5.5 .5 milliliters of blood. And then on September the 27th, did you give uh, release some blood to a defense expert, Mr. Regal? Again, referring to my notes, a handwritten receipt labeled L309 uh, yes I did I re released approximately one milliliter of blood from item number 59 Mark Brown Simpson Nicole and approximately one milliliter of blood from item number 60 Mark Goldman Ronald Did you give anything else to Mr. Regal at that time in terms of reference blood? Yes, I did. What? At that time, I also cut out for him approximately a one-inch square section of each of item number 72 and 82, which were the blood swatches that were provided to us uh, from the two victims from the coroner's office. And then on September the 30th, did you release some more blood to Mr. Regal? Referring to my notes, there is a handwritten receipt marked as L310. And on that date, September 30th, 1994, I released approximately one milliliter of blood to Mr. Regal from the tube, item number 17, marked O.J. Simpson. Now, how did you come up with the approximate of one milliliter? For the uh, seventh, for the twenty seventh of September and the thirtieth of September. For doing that, I used a with a pipetter as opposed to the glass pipette, which is not graduated or not measured. Mentioned before, we have mechanical pipetters that you can set to withdraw and deliver a specific amount of a fluid, and that's what I used in this case, transferring from the vial 
into the centrifuge tubes previously described. Do you know who Mr. Regal is? Yes, I do. Who is he? He is a retired, the previous uh, director of the Orange County Crime Laboratory. And is he now, uh, was he working for the defense at that time? Yes, he was. Okay. So directing your attention to the date of uh, January the 9th of 1994, did you return some evidence on that date from serology to the evidence control unit? January 994. 95, I'm sorry. Okay, again, referring to, there's actually many notes under that date, and yes, I did. And can you tell us with respect to the reference files, items 17, 59, and 60, in this case, whether you returned those items in a sealed condition to the evidence control unit? Yes, I did. What other items did you return on that date? On that date, I returned, we had been storing up to that date, many of the blood or biological evidence items in the serology freezer. And at that point, I inventoried and, and returned these items. I can go through the list if you like. Yeah, I know it's uh, a little time consuming, but if you could. Okay, there was one package that included items 72 through 74. Is there a document that we can use instead for this purpose if there are multiple items? I don't know if there, there is a document that doesn't have significant other writing on it. All right, proceed. And that same package also contained item number 82 through 85. There was one package that contained item number 115 through 117. A, another package that contained item number 170 through 175. Another package to contain item number 293 through 309. Another package ordered to contain item number 118 through 120. An additional package marked to contain item number 78 through 80 and 86 and 87. Another package marked to contain item number 91, 93, and 94 through 102. A box that was marked to contain item numbers 1 through 9, 11 through 14, 20 through 34, 37 through 39, 41 through 45, Slow down. 47 through 52, and 54 through 57. I believe that was the last one. And when you returned those items to the evidence control unit, were they returned in a sealed condition? Yes, they were. And I'd like to turn to some of the testing that you performed in this case, Mr. Matheson. Uh, first of all, when blood evidence is collected from a crime scene and then submitted to the serology laboratory for analysis, what kind of information are you as a serologist looking for to derive from that blood evidence? Well, first off, we want to know whether, in fact, it is blood, uh, if that's what we have. If there is blood present, we want to know whether or not that blood is human in origin. And if that is a fact, then we continue on to identify the different genetic markers that might be present or identifiable in a blood stain or an exemplar blood sample. And are the tests that you perform in serology uh, known as tests of exclusion? That's a term for it, yes. And what does that mean? Well, the idea being is there aren't any tests, particularly in conventional serology, 
that would make a definitive match between a blood stain and a particular individual. They can merely include somebody. In particular, they can exclude somebody. If you are doing an analysis and you find a marker that is in a stain that is not in a reference sample, then you can say absolutely that that blood stain could not have come from that individual. It's an exclusion. When you are doing your testing, do you have to decide what genetic markers that you're going to test for in a given stain? Sometimes. It depends on the quantity. Now, when you're going about deciding what kind of tests you're going to perform, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to include the suspect or exclude the suspect? Now, the idea, if you have to limit your test due to sample size or, or some other consideration, the idea is, is to try and find the test that is most likely to exclude a particular person. Well, why is it that you do it that way? Well, you want to get the most information possible. The idea is to find out whether or not a sample could or could not have come from somebody. And if you only have one shot on it, you want to do the one that's most likely to exclude somebody. Can you give us an example of picking a genetic marker to test for the purposes of exclusion as opposed to picking one in order to try to include someone? Yes, there's, we have a variety of markers that are available to us. Some are better at differentiating between two stains than other ones. An uh, example might be an enzyme that goes by the initials of ADA approximately in the neighborhood of 94 to 97 percent of the population is a type 1. The remainder of the population is a type 2, 1, or a 2. If you use that test, odds are, you know, 94 to 97 percent of the time, you're going to get a type 1, and that doesn't give you a whole lot of information. There's another test that goes by the initials of PGM or PGM subtyping, that rather than having a choice of a 1, a 2, 1, or a 2, you have 10 different possible combinations. And your likelihood then of having, if a blood stain in fact did not come from a particular person, the likelihood of excluding under that system is much better than the one I previously described. So when you say that you're trying to pick out tests to exclude, what would that mean in, in reference to the two examples that you gave us? So it means I would choose the PGM subtype system uh, as my best choice of uh, between the two of them. My odds are if I choose ADA, I'm going to include them because most people are the same type. Uh, my odds are better of excluding using the other system. Now, you've been using a term that you said, uh, that you a, a term called genetic marker. What do you mean when you're talking about genetic marker? Well, genetic marker is something that exists within the human body uh, the term genetic means that it's derived from your parents. Uh, you have to have a certain combination of types because of the genetic information that's supplied to you by your parents. Uh, a marker just means it's something that we can use to identify uh, something within the system. An example of a genetic marker is the ABO blood typing system. You're a type A, type B, type O, or type AB. Your type is determined by the types of your parents, making it genetic, and it's a way of distinguishing potentially two blood samples. Well, when you use this term genetic marker, are you implying in that that the tests that you uh, have done are DNA type tests? No. Why is the term genetic marker used then? Well, the term genetic marker had been around for quite a bit longer than forensic DNA testing. Like I mentioned before, genetic merely refers to the fact that it's determined, you know, it's inherited, it's determined by your parents. So could you view something like eye color, different people having different color eyes as being a genetic marker? Would that be an appropriate usage of the term? As an analogy or an example, eye color uh, could be considered a genetic marker. Your eye color is determined heretic by heredity from your parents. And have you heard of the term polymorphic? Yes, I have. What does that mean? That refers to a situation where you have something within the body, let's say the ABO blood type system, that exists, performs the same function in every person, but exists in different forms. 
So again, if I'm, I'm not sure if this analogy would be proper, but could you view eye color then as being a, a polymorphism and that different people have different color eyes, but all eyes hopefully perform the same task? That's correct. And, and I, you, you see through it, uh, but the eye color is different, but doesn't affect the process. Now, are these um, markers, these genetic markers that you're testing for, are they polymorphic? Yes, they are. Otherwise, there would not be a reason to do it. Now, how many of these uh, polymorphic en enzymes are used in forensic testing? Oh, I'm not sure the exact number. I believe we within our laboratory regularly use uh, seven or eight, something like that. I have to refer to some notes to remember exactly. Are there many more uh, genetic markers in people's blood in addition to those seven or eight? Yes. And how are those chosen? Well, the choice as to what to use forensically is you want something that gives you a good percentage breakdown of the population. In other words, the one I mentioned before, the ADA, is actually a poor polymorphic enzyme in that the majority of the people are the exact same type. Uh, we use it for other reasons because it's very stable. Uh, you want a marker, it would be perfect if you had one that had, say, four different types and each type was 25 percent of the population. Uh, you also need a stable or a system in forensics that is stable because our samples by nature are outside the body. They are deposited in a variety of different places and begin to degrade. You want something that doesn't degrade very quickly. When you say stable, is that what you're talking about, that they don't degrade as easily? That's correct. Do these uh, blood type markers that you're uh, testing for, do they change through someone's lifetime? No, they do not. They stay consistent. And is it possible when you've done a test on a variety of these markers to calculate uh, some sort of a uh, percentage of the population that has those markers? Yes, it is. Now, you uh, used the term ABO blood type system, and you gave us a, a description of that. Uh, and you said there, there are how many types? There are the four common types, A, B, O, and AB. And in addition to this ABO system, is there another set of systems that you're looking at when you're testing for genetic markers? Yes. What is that? Well, there are a variety of one that are called enzymes, which is a chemical that exists in your body to perform function to help keep you alive. Uh, and there are a number of these enzymes that are polymorphic, exist in different types, and can be identified. Can you just give us a simple explanation of, of what an enzyme is? Well, an enzyme is something that catalyzes or makes a reaction occur. Uh, simply, it performs a function within your body that your body needs to exist. All right, Mr. Goldberg, would this be an appropriate point? Sure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a uh, recess, brief recess for the morning. Please remember all my admonitions to you. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves. For many opinions about the case, conduct any deliberations or allow anybody to communicate with you. We'll stand in recess for 15 minutes. And Mr. Matheson, you may step down, sir. All right. All right, back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter, all the parties are again present. Jury is not present. All right, let's have the jurors, please.
that we've now been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Mr. Gregory Matheson is again on the witness stand undergoing direct examination by Mr. Goldberg. And Mr. Goldberg, you may continue. Thank you. That's called electrophoresis. That's correct. And can you tell us what that is? Electrophoresis is a technique that is used to identify the different enzyme types, these polymorphic enzymes that we were talking about before. So is electrophoresis used on ABO or just the enzymes? Well, in the case of the type of testing we're talking about here, it's not used in the ABO. It's used in enzymes, and it's used in other purposes, too. Right. And can you give, give us an uh, explanation of how the electrophoresis technique works? Well, like in the ABO system where you have d different types that can be identified, in these enzymes they also exist in different types. An uh, example being a PGM that I mentioned earlier in its simple form. It's a type 1, a type 2, 1, and a 2. Each of these types differ slightly in their, in their structure or their charge. That's one of the ways we use to tell them apart. The electrophoretic technique involves taking a glass plate that's approximately about eight inches square, pouring a what's called an agarose gel on it, which is kind of like a jello-like substance on the top of it, <clears throat> placing the samples on, you know, like you take small portions of the blood or the claw absorb it onto threads, insert it down into the gel, all in a line. This then is placed on a cooling bath, and electricity is allowed to run through it from one side to the other in one direction. And this basically kind of pushes the enzymes along, and they travel at different rates based on this charge that's on them, the slight differences. After a predetermined amount of time, you stop that electrical process and put chemicals on over the top that work with the enzymes so you can see where the bands lined up. In most of the systems, you identify the type by the quantity and location of these bands on the gel. And in some systems, you do it as far as location and quantity along with the intensity or the darkness or brightness of each of the individual bands. So after running this electrophoresis gel, you get some kind of a banding pattern? That's correct. And, and then what do you do with that banding pattern after it appears? Well, each different type of an enzyme will give a unique banding pattern, so you're then able to interpret it. You don't just do it from memory, though. On each of those gels or each of the plates that I was talking about, which with the system that we have set up, we can run up to 12 samples on it. Out of those 12 samples, three or four of them may be control or known samples of all the different types that are present in the system. So you'd have a situation where you'd have a sample, a control, a couple samples, and a control. That way you can make direct comparisons between your unknown samples and your known types and make the call and determine what type it is. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to mark as people's next in order. It's 215 <clears throat> for identification. Another board entitled Evidence Testing Demonstration. All right, 215. that up just a little higher.
1992. Can you see that? Up a little. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Gober. Thank you. Sir, direct your attention to this exhibit 215 for identification. Uh, the first photograph, photograph number one, door to serology. Have that on the LMO. What does that photograph depict? It, it depicts the door into the serology lab from that hallway from the chart that kind of goes around in a square uh, around the laboratory itself. It also shows, we were talking about windows before, there, though there are no windows to the outside, each of the laboratories has a couple of windows that look from the lab itself into the hallway. So from the hallway, you can see what's going on inside the laboratory? In most areas, some areas you can't see. All right. Now, directing your attention to uh, cell number two on this demonstration exhibit, what does that show? That's a photograph that's taken if you were to walk just inside of the door shown in cell one and turn to the left. It looks down through the serology laboratory. What you see on the left is a uh, personal workbench area or one of the areas of one of our criminalists. To the right, you can just barely make out a little bit of a layout table. And the farther back on the right is one of our group or analytical areas. And can you see where the uh, electrophoresis machines are kept in this particular photograph? Yes, you can. Where's that? Oh, uh, by using the pointer. Towards the right of the photograph, you can see these reddish ends. Those are all the electrophoresis cooling plates or cooling tanks that I talked about earlier. Now, direct your attention to cell number three on this exhibit. What does this show? Okay, as I described in the process before, in the electrophoresis, you pour a gel on a plate that's about eight inches square or something like that. That is depicted in the picture, one of those plates. The gel is on the glass part there that you you actually can't see the gel because it's clear. Then there's a row of slits that are put in it where the samples are introduced. It's called loading the gel. Each one of these red marks that you see is indicative of either a unknown sample or a control or known sample. And going through the uh, four items here, can you tell us where the unknown samples would be as opposed to the known samples? Well, my practice in running a gel is I put a Unknown in the first, a known sample in the second, unknown in the third and the fourth, and then a known one would go in the fifth spot. Okay, when you say unknown, you're talking about what? When I, anytime I refer to an unknown sample, it's an evidence sample. We don't know the results of it at this point. Okay, and the known is what? The known is a, a portion of blood that we know the source of that blood, and we've already characterized and know what the types of them are. And is that what you use to compare the unknown against? Yes. Now, after the plate is loaded, what, what's done with the plate? Okay, the plate then is laid in this la or the fourth cell here that's marked electrophoresis. The white part in between the two red ends is a cooling plate. There's a, a bath or a, a mechanism not too far away from here, which has a refrigerant in it that lowers the temperature of the water. The water is then circulated back and forth through these plates so that the electrophoresis gel is kept at a low temperature, so it's laid on top of that. And finally, if we look at the fifth cell where it says run gel, what is this showing? Okay, this shows a couple of different tanks side by side. The right one here has a gel laying on the cooling bath. To actually run the electrophoresis system, there's white what are filter paper called wicks on either side of it. They are in a tank. It has a buffer solution. The wicks are laid across the edges of the gel on both sides. And then there's cords that go up to the power supply located towards the top of the picture. And electricity is run through the buffer, through the wicks, across the gel, and then back into the power supply. They have to be kept cold because most of our systems on, in this type run at approximately 350, 400 volts. And that would, if there wasn't a cooling system, it would actually heat the gels up and dry them out, and the process wouldn't work. Now, if this were a real case and this uh, evidence were to be run, what would you have to do after the item had been, the uh, gel had been placed on the plate as depicted in cell five? Well, like you... I'm, 
do you close, do, is that door, the plexiglass door closed or, or what? Well, right, like I mentioned, the, the wicks would have to be laid from the tanks onto the edges of the gel. You'd close this lid because you don't want to come in contact with the voltage that's running through it. And the wires that are at the back of the unit are placed into the uh, power supply, which is above it. Now, if we could go back to cell number four for a second. Can you point out for us where it is that the uh, samples are that have been loaded onto the gel in this photograph? They're a little tough to see, but what you see that the gel is being held up. The gel is on a piece of glass being held up on its side, and they're the reddish spots that show up uh, about two inches or so from the bottom of the gel. So are those closer to the analyst's right hand or left hand? They're closer to his right hand. And uh, can you tell us, using this photograph, when the machine is hooked up and the electricity is actually running through it, can you describe for us what happens? Well, as far as, uh, like I mentioned in the description before, the current runs through it. There's a positive side and a negative side, and it <laughs> runs from the positive to, correction, the negative side and a positive side, runs from the negative to the positive side, and the enzymes that are present in there, they are such that they, they move along through the gel at a slightly different rate depending on the structure of them, and the structure is what determines the type. So which way do they move uh, as it's placed on the machine this way? Would they go from his right hand to his left hand or, or, or the other way? Well, it depends on the system. Uh, this system here that he's setting up appears to be a PGM subtype system that we use, and it would be running from the right to the left. And when they run from the right to the left, can you actually see some sort of a banding pattern with your naked eye after it's finished? No, you cannot. What do you have to do in order to see that? After the runtime, you remove this gel from the cooling plate, and you have prepared what are called uh, development chemicals. And they are optimized for a particular enzyme system. The chemicals contain or the uh, solution contains chemicals that react with the enzyme so that we can see them. Normally, if it's a, a visible thing that you can see with your eye in, in white light, it's a dark bluish, almost black type of band forms. There's other type that react with what are called fluorescent chemicals, and you have to look at them under ultraviolet light. And after the uh, plate is run and the development ch chemicals are put on, is something done to uh, preserve that plate? Yes, the plate itself is not preserved. However, the results are photographed. They're actually photographed several times throughout the development process. It doesn't just pop up all at once. It slowly becomes visible uh, in most of the systems, and you take pictures along the way. All right. And do you read your results off the plate or off the photographs? Actually, to some extent, both. You read them uh, from both of them. How complex is this technique? How complex was this for you to learn how to do this technique? Well, it's not a terribly easy technique, but it also isn't difficult. I, I was able to, I mentioned yesterday a course that I took back at the FBI Academy, which lasted two, about two weeks in duration. During that two weeks, I went into it with having used this technique maybe less than half a dozen times or so, just practicing in the laboratory. And within the two weeks, I became fairly proficient at uh, running samples. No, thank you. You said it was possible to calculate the frequencies of people that have different genetic markers that you've tested. Uh, is there a rule known as the product rule that you apply in doing this? Yes. What is that? What that is is it allows you to determine the types of different markers you identify in a stain it's possible to, you know, just through statistics, you know, going back to the ABO blood typing system, that a certain percentage of the population is a type A, a certain percentage B, and so on. This is also true of the different enzymes that I'm talking about. So once you have identified the type, say, in two different markers, ABO blood system and maybe this PGM system that we've talked about, you can multiply together the percentages of each of the types that are present and come out with a smaller percentage of the population that has those two types together. Can you give us an example of that? 
Well, starting with the ABO system, about roughly half of the population is a type O, or about 50% of the population. If that was the only test that was available for us, we could analyze, say, a blood stain, we determined that it is a type O, and the best information out of that is that half the people in this room could have contributed that blood stain. Well, then we'd go ahead and run one of these additional uh, genetic markers, and let's say out of that we identify a type that also exists in 50% of the population. Well, now we have two pieces of information. You can multiply those two together, and now you know that that stain down there that is an AVO type O plus this other marker exists in about 25% of the population, or about one every four people out of, rather than one out of every two. With each additional marker you add, you keep multiplying that percentage, and the number of possible people that could have left the stain gets smaller and smaller. So if you had a third marker in your hypothetical that was also 50%, would you multiply the 25 times 50 for 12 and a half? Yeah, I'm gonna have to move to strike that last answer. Uh, as being lack of foundation in, I think we need to approach on this. Oh. Yes, that's correct. With each additional marker, if it was half, you'd keep cutting the number in half. It would go from one in four to one in eight to one in 16 and so on. And is this uh, use of the product rule in uh, calculating the percentage of the population that has a given set of uh, genetic markers, one that is accepted in the forensic science community? Yes, it is. Uh, for how long has this been used? Which? If you know, the product rule in terms of applying it in this context with ABO systems and the uh, genetic, other genetic markers. Sustain. Well, the ABO system plus the other enzymes systems that you type. Today. What systems? Well, you said that there are about eight or so enzyme systems that you type. That we have the capability of typing in our laboratory, okay. yes. And is that pretty standard throughout the forensic community that those are the systems that are used? With some slight variation, but yes, that's the core set. With respect to the systems that you are using in your laboratory, how long, if you know, have has the product rule been used to calculate the frequencies of those systems together with ABO? Well, it has been used in our laboratory uh, since I started, which was in uh, 1978, and I believe it's is. The markers have become available. They've been used with each new one as it uh, is developed. Okay. Now, in terms of the uh, conventional serology the, and the electrophoresis test that you've been discussing this morning, is there a problem with cross-contamination between the samples as you're doing the test? I'm sorry, you repeat the question? Is there a problem with cross-contamination as you're testing these items? If I understand what you're saying, I mean, you always want to be careful that you don't allow one item to come in contact with another one so that you have the potential of transferring uh, information between the two. How sensitive is this particular test? Well, these... Sustain. How much of a sample do you need in order to be able to test uh, an item of evidence using electrophoresis? For the systems that we use, uh, we need a sample that has, you know, some color to it, you know, towards towards a pale to dark red, uh, approximately a quarter inch long, uh, thread sized is about the amount of sample you'd need to get a good result. And if we were to um, define contamination as being introducing something onto a piece of biological evidence that was to cause the evidence to be mistyped. What would you need to do in order to contaminate biological evidence using that definition? Well, in the area of the conventional type of typing we're talking about, you don't get results with, with samples that you can't see. It would have to be a sufficient quantity that you're visibly seeing that you're transferring sample from one to the other. So it would be something that you would visually see? Yes. And uh, to your knowledge, has there ever been a problem of contamination, as I've defined it, inside of your laboratory in the serology section? 
a problem as far as contamination in the conventional systems? Yes. Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Okay. And in the area of uh, PCR testing, do you use uh, kits that are manufactured by an outside firm? Yes, we do. Who does that come from? The company's changed hands a couple times. It was uh, originally Cetus. I, I believe it's Roche uh, Biochemicals now. Okay. And with respect to those kits, to your knowledge, has there ever been any defect in the kits that you were supplied? Well, I was made aware of a time in our laboratory where we were getting results showing up in our controls and other areas in the process that was eventually, we believe, traced back to uh, a particular lot of kids. Was that prior to June 14th of last year? Yes, it was. Can you give us an estimation of how much prior? Uh, at least a couple months. I'm not exactly sure of the date. And what was this problem? Well, we were showing a type within that system uh, was typable or becoming apparent in our controls uh, in areas where we were not expecting to see any result at all. What do you mean it was becoming apparent in the controls? Well, there are controls built into the system that allow you to check whether or not there is a presence of contamination. Contamination is a fact of life when it comes to forensic samples. So you always have controls built in, both the controls that are picked up at the scene, plus controls that are introduced at different stages of the testing that should come out blank when you're all done, should not yield a result. And if a result is obtained during, you know, in some of these controls, it shows that there is some sort of contamination occurring. And did the controls, in fact, work for that purpose in this instant? Yes, they did. Now, was this a um, incident that you were personally involved in or had personal involvement with? No. Did you ever read any documentation around the time that it occurred pertaining to the incident? No, I did not. And how was it resolved? I was advised by the people that were doing the test that I, upon receiving a new lot kit uh, from the company, we were no longer seeing that type showing up in our controls. When you say a lot, what are you, what are you talking about? Well, when things are produced or manufactured, they put a lot number on it so that you can track. I, I would assume they came from the same batch of chemicals or whatever in the factory, but there is a assigned lot number to a sequence of, of reagents or kits. Okay. Now, going back to a conventional testing for, for a moment, uh, In the area of conventional testing, does the laboratory take proficiency tests? Yes. And what are those? Well, we subscribe to a couple of different outside companies that supply us with unknown samples. Uh, one of them is Collaborative Testing Service, and the other is CAP, or the College of American Pathologists. They send us uh, case-like samples. We don't know the results of them. And as supervisor, I'd receive these items and either divide, if there is sufficient sample, divide them up against, between a number of the analysts within the laboratory, or if it was a small sample, assign it to one particular analyst. And they would test them. We would then submit our results to whatever company it happened to be, and then uh, uh, get the results back from them at a later time. And do you also take proficiency tests in the area of PCR testing in your laboratory? Yes. And how's that done? the similar process. As a matter of fact, the both CAP and CTS now are gearing them more towards the DNA process than conventional. And have those proficiency tests been passed? Yes. And we were talking a little bit about the substrate controls and the use of the controls yesterday. When you're doing your <clears throat> conventional testing, do you use those controls in any way? Yes, I do for part of the testing. For what part do you use them? I use them during the course of determining whether or not a sample is human and in the ABO testing. When you use a substrate control, or when you use substrate controls in this case, did you use the entire cloth square or a portion of it? 
Just a portion. What do you do with it in order to take a portion? I would I open up the bindle that contains it and I would make a cutting from it that is appropriate size for the test that I want to run. Uh, I may not do a cutting. Sometimes I'll actually take uh, tweezers or forceps and tease out a couple of the threads or fibers that are present. And why is that used in the ABO system? It's because it's known that there are things out there besides ABO substances that will give activity or results that, that can mimic or look like ABO. Uh, certain types of cloth can tend to give you what's called a false positive for an ABO antigen, which is one of the things we look at when we're typing for the ABO system. And you want to know if the surface where you're staying on is going to have this type of activity present. Was the uh, laboratory using substrate controls prior to the use of PCR technology? Yes. And was it because of the, the ABO system, for the reasons that you just described, that you did that? Yes, that's correct. W what about for the other genetic markers that you're typing? Do you use the substrate controls for that? No, I do not. Why do you not use them for those? Well, as opposed to the ABO system, where I mentioned there are things out there that can mimic the same type of activity, uh, that is not true for the enzyme systems that we use. And what about the idea of testing them for the purposes of determining whether there was any typable information on the substrate control? Why, why wouldn't you do that when you're doing electrophoresis? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I do use it for the human test. And if that comes up negative, there is no uh, biological material present that I would, it would give me a result. Would you expect to get any result on electrophoresis if you saw a substrate control that had no visible blood on it? If we're talking about a blood stain, no, I would not. Yeah. <coughs> now, in uh, June and September of last year, did you do certain testing on some of the items uh, bearing the DR number of this case? Yes, I did. And did you generate reports related to that testing? Yes. This time I'd like to mark what's called the serology results chart as people's next in order. That'd be 216. 216. So I direct your attention to people's 216 for identification. Uh, have you seen this chart before? Yes, I have. Well, didn't we mark this earlier as 202? The chart? Ms. Martinez confirms that yes, we did. Yes, you did. All right. We did. All right. People's 202. Mr. Goldberg. Thank you. Sir, showing you people's 202 for identification, does that summarize information that was contained on reports that you generated in connection with your testing in this case? It summarizes information from the reports plus some additional information from some of the notes. All right, now, starting first with the notes, what kind of notes do you generate when you're testing items uh, contemporaneously with the testing? Well, there is, while the testing is going on, what is prepared is a serology case summary sheet, which will eventually have a summary of all the results on each of the items. I, while I'm doing this, I'm referring to some notes I have of my 
analysis from June of 1994, just so I can make sure I remember all the different forms. So I described there's a serology case summary sheet. There is also what has been previously described, serology item description notes. Those are the notes where we give a little bit more detailed description of the actual item. And then there are what are called electrophoresis worksheets that are created during the electrophoresis process. Each plate that you saw earlier will have a sheet that goes along with it to identify the uh, different samples and where they are located on the gel. There may also be just uh, note pages, blank pages. Sometimes we'll write on the back of some of these for some additional information. And are, are the notations, the notes that you just referred to, ones that have been labeled with L numbers and provided to both sides in discovery? Yes, that's correct. Um, now, which are the, the reports that are done at the time of the test? Which are the, the two types of reports that are done contemporaneously with the test? Well, the type that is done contemporaneously with the test, the electrophoresis worksheet, which uh, would go along with each of the electrophoresis runs I described. There is also, I mentioned that sometimes we'll take notes on the back of a page. In the ABO blood typing test, we don't have necessarily a form where that's recorded. A lot of times we just write the raw data on the back of one of the other pages, and that's done while you're actually doing the analysis. And what type of... Uh information or where did the information come from that was used to compile this chart? Was it just the the reports, the analyzed evidence reports or also the electrophoresis worksheets? I believe information that went under this report came from uh, my reports or they were put on this came from my reports. Combination of that, the uh, case summary sheet and the electrophoresis worksheets. Now, does this uh, particular Who actually did that testing physically? Well, it depends on which part you're talking about. I, I did some, and then I observed some placement, and some of the actual hands-on work on the electrophoresis was done by Mr. Yamauchi. Now, when you say that the electrophoresis was done by Mr. Yamauchi, uh, what did he do? Was it in your presence? Most of it was, not all of it. Well, what did you see him doing? Well, one of the most important parts of that test, as far as sample continuity, is recording on the electrophoresis sheet which sample goes in which lane and then making sure that the sample you're saying is on the sheet is actually in that lane. I sat alongside of him while we sampled, you know, to open up, in the case of, say, item number 49, open up the bindle, cut a small portion from the swatch. It was then placed into a numbered well, which corresponded with the number on the electrophoresis sheet, and I watched him then transfer that into the gel along with the exemplar samples and the uh, known standard samples that were included. So he did the physical manipulations in terms of loading the gel? When it came to the electrophoresis work, yes. And that was in your presence? Yes, it was. And then what happened after the gel had been run and the results were ready to be read? At that point, I, he took photographs of them. When I was available, I, I co-read them with him and we determine what types were present on the plate. Now, sir, do you recall um, testifying about the tests when you testified at the preliminary hearing? <clears throat> In this case? Yes, I do. Council, directing your attention to page four of the preliminary hearing on July the 8th, 1994. I'd like to read between uh, lines two and lines 23. Page 
between two and twenty three. Does the same. court have, have a copy? Yes, I do. Page four. The prior same. prior and consistent statement. Well, hold on for a second. Saying 1235 is an exception. Is that yes? Yes. Proceed. Sir, um, at the preliminary hearing, did you testify as follows to the following questions? Question I think where we left off yesterday, I think you indicated that you tested item 49 which was the blood drop from the trail left at 875 South Bundy, shown in the close-up in photograph E and shown in perspective in photograph D. Do you recall saying that? Answer, that's correct. Question, and you tested, and you tested that initially to determine if it was human origin. Answer, yes. Question, and with respect to the blood samples that were retrieved from the defendant and from Ronald Goldman and Nicole, Brown Simpson, with respect to those samples, did you test them also? Answer, yes, I did. Question, what test did you perform on those? Answer, on those, I performed the ABO blood typing test, the group one enzyme electrophoresis test, and the PGM subtype electrophoresis test. Question, and did you also subject the blood drop from the trail, item 49, to those same tests? Answer, yes, I did. Do you recall that testimony? Yes, I do. Now, sir, uh, when you answered those questions, did you specify that the physical loading onto the gel was actually done by Mr. Yamauchi in your presence? No, I did not. And why not? I didn't think it was necessary. Were the two of you working together as a team in doing this? Yes, we were. And did you observe all of the critical parts in the analysis? Yes, I did. And uh, did you feel, were you trying to mislead anyone or leave Mr. Yamuchi out and answering those questions in that way? No, not at all. Is it common in your laboratory for analysts to work together in the laboratory uh, using a team approach such, such as that? Does that happen? It happens, yes. And where you observe the critical aspects of what the other analysts did? Yes. And is that what happens with respect to the, the typing on 1759? 60 and uh, 49. Yes, it is. <clears throat> now, Mr. Matheson, uh, did you also generate and analyze evidence report describing the testing that you did uh, and Mr. Yamauchi did on these items? Yes, I did. And I'd like to mark that as people's next in order. It's L7778 for council's benefit. Mr. Robertson, next in order, people. 216. It's entitled Anal Analyzed Evidence Report. The date the analysis completed is 628. All right, proceed. Thank you. Oh, 
In order, we're going to have to lower the serology results chart a little bit in order to get this on. Maybe necessary to move it entirely. What? Remove it entirely. Well, let's try that. Let's try it. Sir, do you recognize the document that we just put on the uh, Elmo People's 216 for identification? Yes, I do. What is that? That is a copy of my analyzed evidence report. And was this analyzed <clears throat> evidence report generated, uh, when was this generated in relationship to the testimony at the preliminary hearing that we just read? Well, it was generated immediately following testing prior to the preliminary hearing. Okay. Uh, can we see the full, first full paragraph where this starts with ABO testing was performed? <clears throat> uh, Mr. Matheson, did you write this form? Yes, I did. And could you, you just read for us what you wrote in the uh, first full paragraph saying all that starts all ABO? typing well the first paragraph is just that one line says and i'm reading from a copy of my of the report myself rather than off one of the monitors all abo typing was performed exclusively by matheson b8927 and what was the next paragraph starting with criminalist yamauchi well the next paragraph starts with enzyme typing for esd pgm pgm subtype and glo were performed by criminalist Yamauchi G8880, period. All evidence handling, including original sampling and transfers to the gels, were witnessed by Matheson, period. All results were confirmed in person or by photographs by Matheson. So did you, wh why did you write this, uh, these two paragraphs to describe what you did and what Mr. Yamauchi did? To be accurate as far as exactly who performed what tests uh, for the report. Okay. And you wrote this paragraph out prior to testifying at the preliminary hearing where you said that you did the electrophoresis test? Yes, I did. All right. Thank you. Now, we've been using the term reference samples. What does that mean? But the way I use it is it refers to the known blood samples or blood samples of a known source related to a case. And our, and our serology results chart, how are those designated? Well, the reference samples that are designated on the chart are first indicated by their item number and then in parentheses by the person that they were uh, taken from. And then the little blood drops would designate what? As far as the icons go, the blood drops reference uh, stain or evidence material. And when you do these tests, are you comparing the uh, results from the reference samples to the results that you get on the unknowns that are designated with these little blood drops? Yes. Now, in September of uh, 1994, did you also do another series of testing on items uh, that are represented in the people's serology results chart. Yes, I started some testing in September. And on September 11th, what item numbers that are on the results chart did you test, if any? Okay, on September 11th? Yeah. Was when I started working on item number 42. Item number 44. Fifty. Item number 54. Item 
item number 84 a and b and item number 85 a and b and on september the 20th did you do some testing on items that are contained on the uh, serology results chart okay, i'm going to be referring to my notes i received some additional items on september 18th as far as doing the analysis Yes, there was some analysis done on September 20th. Which items? That would be on item number 13 and item number 37. When you say 13 on the chart, we have 13A. Is that the little cutting that you testified to earlier this morning? Yes. That you took off the uh, one of the socks, item 13? That's correct. And did you also do some testing on September the 27th on items that are contained on the serology results chart? Again, referring to electrophoresis worksheet, I did run uh, some samples on that date, yes. Which ones? That would be item number 57. and item number 78. And where were those items stored during the testing that you did in September? They were in the freezer in the serology unit. Now, with regard to these various items that are on the serology results chart, <laughs> when you were looking at the Los Angeles Police Department ev evidence disposition summary boards, People's 177, did it contain the packaging of these various items represented on the photographs on those exhibits? Yes, it did. And when you were doing the testing, was the, uh, were the items coming out of the original packaging or the transmittal packaging that was used later on when it was sent out? I believe out of the original. Okay. But in, in each case, did you... Uh, look at the item number and DR number prior to the test to confirm what you were testing? Yes. Now, going back to the uh, serology results chart, there's a column that says ABO. What does that refer to? That refers to the ABO blood typing system that I've described previously. And what does ESD mean right next to ABO? ESD are the initials for one of the enzymes that we analyzed that I previously described. And what about PGM subtype? Uh, same thing. Uh, it's a enzyme that can be broken down into types. And EAP, what does that mean? EAP also are initials standing for another enzyme that we use. And then what's in the consistent with column? Consistent with are a list of names uh, that are placed there when a comparison could be made between the evidence samples and the exemplar or reference samples. And what about the frequency? What does that represent? Frequency gives an indication of how common that combination of types occurs in the general population. Now, on this particular chart, there's a uh, number of items that are in blue that say INC. What, are the, what does that mean? INC stands for inconclusive. How is that reported when you actually write out a uh, analyzed evidence report? <coughs> Any result that's determined to be inconclusive at the time that it's run is written strictly as either INC or inconclusive on the report with no indication of a type given. So it wouldn't say on your analyzed evidence report, for instance, for um, item number 42, inconclusive B? No, definitely not. And where does that information come from? It comes from a combination of the case summary notes and the original electrophoresis uh, worksheet. Well, why don't you write exactly word for word what's on the uh, elect electrophoresis worksheet and the case summary notes onto 
the analyzed evidence report? Why don't they match 100%? Well, the electrophoresis worksheet is just that. It's a worksheet that's being used while the test is being run. You're recording the conditions of the run and you're recording all observations and inter not interpretations, but observa observations that are made on the plate. Uh, we even include guesses at that point, or, and if it's a guess, it's marked as inconclusive. That information then is transferred over to the summary sheet intact, it's kind of summarizing the information on the worksheet. Uh, if it's inconclusive, it's marked as ink, and the potential or possible guess of the type is placed in that column. However, when the report is written, it just reflects inconclusive. So is an inconclusive statement, if it says inconclusive B, does that mean that it could be wrong? It's possible, yeah. Is that why you say inconclusive? Oh, inconclusive means that just that it is not a conclusive decision or conclusive result as to what the analysis uh, showed. And does that mean that as, as a uh, forensic scientist, when you say something is inconclusive, let's say on your worksheet you said it was inconclusive B, would you be willing to report in court that it was in fact a B? No, I would not. Okay. And why is that? Again, it's not a conclusive result. I don't want to put something down on my report or present to court unless I'm sure as to uh, what the result is. So what is the point then of writing an inconclusive B, for example, on the electrophoresis worksheet if you don't put it on the analyzed evidence report and you're not willing to testify in court that it was in fact a B? Well, because it's information. First off, the worksheet, like I described, it's things you're recording as you're reading it. I mentioned earlier that sometimes the bands, they get darker with time, and what may start out as a type with a question mark or an inconclusive over time may become a conclusive reading as it gets darker and more easy to read. Uh, there are times where you will record something as a potential inconclusive or with a question mark, and that's the way it stays. It just never gets any better. What kind of information can those provide, though? Well, potentially it can show, you know, give you an idea of what might not be there, but it is still not a conclusive result. Okay. Now, we were talking about uh, degradation yesterday and whether or not a degraded sample could turn from one blood type into another. Do you recall that conversation? Yes, I do. And you said that that is not a problem except with respect to one of the genetic marker systems. What did you mean by that? Well, uh, the majority of the markers that we look at, like I mentioned, as they degrade, they just get weaker and weaker and you can't determine a type. It doesn't change <laughs> into another type. The most notable exception to that is in the system that goes by the initials of EAP. EAP is a type of system that I mentioned before that there were situations where it was the location of the band or the uh, number of bands that tells you what type it is, and there are other ones that deal with intensity of the bands. EAP is one of those type of systems. You look at the intensity or how bright a band shows up to determine what the potential type is. I'm... All right. the intensities and take that into consideration when you're determining what the type is. So in the case of EAP, it is known that a degradation route occurs where the bands become less and less intense and can eventually be mistyped. Now, with respect to the PGM subtype, do you have those same issues in PGM subtype that you have in EAP? Not when it comes to evidentiary samples. It has been shown that liquid blood stored for a long period of time, you can start slowly losing the minus bands. You'll notice under the PGM subtype, there's a plus and a minus indication. Uh, it is possible to eventually see the minus bands degrade, but that does not occur in dried samples. So in dried samples, such as a stain, what happens in the PGM subtype system when you get degradation? The bands just 
uh, become weaker and weaker to the point where when you develop it on the gel, you just don't see anything. Can you have a situation in the PGM subtype where the bands have degraded <clears throat> so that you can see something there, but it's an inconclusive? Oh, sure. That's another use of inconclusive is that we know something is occurring. We can see that there's something there. Another indication we have goes by the initials of NA or no activity. Uh, if you see kind of a hazy appearance in the, in the band area, you can't say no activity because something is going on, so it would be recorded as inconclusive. So let's just take one example, uh, item 13A, that has the PGM subtype of 1 plus. Uh, now, this was an, is this a, a result that you classify as being inconclusive, or is this a final result? That is a final result. So what does that mean, as opposed to an inconclusive result in this particular case? It means that the blood stain that was present on that item is a PGM subtype 1 plus. Hey, now, could have it been something else and degraded into a 1 plus? Not in my experience or knowledge, no. Okay. And in this particular case, the one plus would be consistent with whom? Well, of the three parties that are on this chart, uh, it is can be in, is consistent with the type that we found for item number fifty nine, Nicole Brown, and is inconsistent with, or definitely could not have come from uh, the item number seventeen, uh, Mr. Simpson, or number sixty, Mr. Goldman. Now, uh, getting back to the, this issue that we were talking about on, on degradation, what about the ABO? Well, what about the ESD results? Can degradation cause those results to change from one pattern to another? No. And what about ABO? Not an ABO either. You won't get a change of a type. So of the uh, four systems that we have here, is EAP the only system that has this problem that you've been discussing? Uh, where the degradation can make it appear to be something other than what it really was. That's correct. Now, Mr. Matheson, is this um, phenomena that exists within the EAP system, but not the others, one that is recognized in the forensic science literature? Yes, it is. And have you read articles that discuss the special issues that are uh, inherent in the EAP system? Yes, I have. Did you read a uh, article, Mr. Matheson, that was by um, D uh, Dr. Grunbaum and Zajac entitled Problems of Reliability in Phenotyping? of erythrocyte acid phosphatase and blood stains? Yes, I have. And did you uh, consider that as part of uh, this forensic science literature that we've been discussing that discusses this issue with EAP? Yes. All right, Ms. Uh, Goldberg, would you spell those items for the full Sure. Paper? Starting with Dr. Grunbaum. Uh, Grunbaum is G-R-U-N-B-A-U-M. And Zajac is Z-A-J-A-C. The article is Problems of Reliability in Phenotyping, P-H-E-N-O-T-Y-P-I-N-G, of Erythrocyte, E-R-Y-T-H-R-O-C-Y-T-E, Acid, Phosphatase, P-H-O-S-P-H-A-T-A-S-E. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, by the way, is, is Erythrocyte Acid Phosphatase what we are designating with the initials EAP. Yes, it is. And in our preparations, uh, in our sessions where we discussed the case prior to your testimony, did you teach me at some length how to pronounce that term? Yes. How did I do? Yeah. Yeah. Sustained. OK. Now, um, with respect to uh, the uh, article that we just talked about.
May I approach the witness, please? Sir, show me the gun. An article uh, that we just read the title of. Is this one of the articles that you looked at? Yes, it is. And on page 617 of that article, does uh, Dr. Grunbaum discuss some of the issues that you've been explaining to us this uh, morning about the EAP system? Yes. And can you read for us the, the first full paragraph of what Dr. Grunbaum says? Although only a limited number of samples were used in this initial experiment, the results shown in Table 1 clearly indicate that there can be a definite problem with the EAP phenotyping no matter which electrophoretic supporting medium is used. What does that mean? Well, the electrophoretic, electrophoretic supporting medium is, in the case that we showed, the example agros, there's just different types of materials that it can be run in. Uh, the paragraph just indicates that there can be problems with this uh, using this system. And can you read the second full paragraph? Unlike other enzyme systems, EAP phenotyping depends not only on a pattern of relative distribution of bands, but also on the relative intensities of the bands. When blood is aged, the individual isozymes, those are the bands in it, I added them, tend to degrade at different rates further exacerbating the difficulties of true phenotype identification. And I think you've explained this already in your testimony in different terms, is that correct? Yes, basically. And, uh, and with respect to the last full paragraph under summary, can you read that for us? <clears throat> I'm sorry, are we talking about the underlying part of the paragraph itself? The paragraph. Oh, under summary, excuse me. Erythrocyte acid phosphatase is a useful system for the crime laboratory for both fresh and degraded blood and blood stains, provided the inherent problems of phenotyping this particular enzyme system are recognized. Because of the great number of variables affecting this enzyme system in vitro, phenotyping should not be attempted unless the complete history of origin and handling of the sample is known. Now, with respect to the last point about not typing uh, erythrocyte acid phosphatase unless the complete history and origin of the sample is known. What does that refer to? Well, his reference there, I believe, is, is suggesting that you should not be doing this unless you know exactly what the history of it is, which means where it was deposited, potentially the length of time, the conditions it was under, as opposed to somebody just walking into a laboratory with a blood stain. Exactly. Right. No foundation that he knows what that author meant. Sustain. Sir, within the forensic science community, is there a, um, are, are there analysts that believe that you should know the complete history and origin of the sample before starting EAP test, before making a EAP conclusion? Okay. Sustain. What did you understand that to mean in terms of your reading of the article and your interpretation of the article? Well, my reading of that, I, I understand or that it is being suggested that it's important to understand the history behind a sample and what conditions it was collected and preserved under. And where do you stand on that particular issue as to whether or not uh, that's necessary? Well, I'm, I kind of sit in the middle of it. There are differences of opinion of this, and this has been an area of discussion when it comes to dealing with samples and serology in general, in that some people feel it's very important that the criminalist not be biased by any sort of outside information to receive a blood stain, you know, cold without anything, and you just report the results that you find. There are also those that believe, as indicated in that article, that it's important to know the background, the story behind how the sample was deposited and taking all of that into account. I, I don't really believe in either extreme. I don't particularly like to work in the dark. That's very difficult to do. However, I also appreciate the fact that you do not want your opinion biased in any way by any information that isn't directly related to the evidence. Okay. Now, with respect to the EAP system, you were talking about that in this system that not only do you look at the bands, but you also look at the intensity of the bands. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And does that distinguish it from PGM subtype? Yes. Why? 
Well, in PGM subtyping, it's the location of the band, where it appears in the gel in relation to your known standards, as opposed to how strong or how light the bands are. So you're not looking at the intensity or brightness of the bands when you're talking about PGM subtype? That's correct. Given that you're looking at the intensity of the bands on EAP, as opposed to PGM subtype, is there some element of subjectivity in terms of making a call as to an EAP result? Yes, there is. What is that? Well, not only do these systems differ in intensity versus band location, they're also developed differently. The PGM system is developed, you get a, a dark blue, almost black band that you look at under visible light. In the EAP system, the bands you're looking at, you have to look under ultraviolet light. Rather than being dark, they are actually a light source. They're bright. Uh, and people's eyes see different things as far as the intensity of what they're looking at. It's a very subjective call. So you don't have that problem, though, with the, with the, the PGM? No. Subtype. What about with ABO? Or is none of this applicable to ABO? There's no comparison to ABO on this. OK. Your Honor, I'd like to mark as people's... 217. 217, a, uh, another board that says EAP phenotype board. All right, 217. Mr. Fertlow, can you lower that down a little bit so that perhaps we could also put some pictures on the Elmo later on? Mr. Matheson, showing you people's 217 for identification, uh, what is this exhibit? What this exhibit shows is a block diagram or kind of a graphical representation of the six most common EAP phenotypes. And maybe we could just take a look at, at the photograph on the evidence testing board, again, that uh, shows the, the plates on the electrophoresis machine while we're waiting to put that up. Can you go through the uh, six common phenotypes and just explain to us what you're, well, first of all, I know you've, you've already described this, but a phenotype is what again? Well, it's the, the type that is observed on the gel that's identified for the eventual reporting. Okay. And can you tell us what the six common EAP phenotypes are? They appear on the right hand column there, it's type A, type B, type C, type BA, type CB, and type CA. And when you're testing a system using the EAP system, is it, uh, does it fall under one of these six types generally? Generally it does, yes. All right. if it... Now, if you can take a look at our uh, evidence testing board, we have the photograph of items being loaded onto the uh, gel. Can you just orient these two exhibits for us and tell us, I mean, how this would correlate? Well, to put the two in relation to each other, if you were to take the, the electrophoresis plate that you see up there and rotate it 90 degrees to the left, the, where he's putting the samples in are what we refer to as the origin. That's the origin, the place where the samples start. And that would correspond in the 
EAP diagram to the line or the area that's marked with the word origin right above it. And then you were talking about how after it's the electrophoresis machine is hooked up, the sample begins to migrate across the gel and that it creates a banding pattern. Can you describe for us what that would look like using the EAP phenotype board? Well, using this as an example, you'd start at the origin. We've also mentioned lanes, and a lane would refer to an area where a sample is placed and then it moves. It moves along in roughly the same size and shape or configuration as where you originally put your sample. So in this particular example, we have six lanes that are marked by the six different types. Your sample would be placed in the origin, a uh, well at the origin, current would pass through it, and the different portions of the enzyme would be moving along, and at some point you stop that, and I uh, develop it, and you'd see the bands in their location. Now, you said that when you are looking at this plate, you look not only at the placement of the bands, but also intensity. Can you describe that for us using this diagram? Well, the, it's, a, it's a block diagram. It's not an actual photograph or something of a plate. It's just a graphical representation of it. I, we look at intensities in the system. We also look at locations of where the bands appear. It's a combination of the two. As you can see, under the lane that's marked A, the block diagram shows bands in different places than in the B. I also want to point out at this point that we show a block appearing on the far left of it in each of the lanes. This is just consistent with every type and is insignificant when it comes to determining what the type is of a sample. So you see that the location difference between the A and the B, however, also graphically demonstrated by this is the fact that there are different sizes. And the sizes are an indication of the intensity. Uh, you'll notice in the A, they're about equal size. They be show up about equal intensity or brightness. The B, the larger block band would show up as significantly brighter than the smaller block band in the B column, and then that's consistent throughout the rest of the uh, items. Your Honor, I'm sorry. I was so excited by this EAP block diagram. I didn't see that we had run over. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our recess for the afternoon. Please remember all my admonitions to you. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves. Don't form any opinions about the case. Don't conduct any deliberations till the matter has been submitted to you. Do not allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. We'll stand in recess until 1 p.m. Mr. Matheson, your order turned 1 p.m. All parties, including the clerk, are again present for the court. Let's have the jurors, please. I want to bring up, if I may. What is that? As to, uh, there's an item 118 in this case that was tested by Mr. Matheson, and there has not been any testimony about it uh, in this case heretofore. It was a knife that was found in the area of the defendant's house, but not on his property, which was tested and has an EAP type B, similar to the, the nails. I think it may have been mentioned by Mr. Cochran in his opening statement. Uh, we would uh, ex ask to exclude evidence of that knife under 402 and the testing results. On we don't need to do that now. Well, it's, it's part of a of an analyzed evidence report that I'd like to show the witness, and there is reference to it there, and I, I would like to be able to sanitize that out. Mr. Blazier? Yeah, we, uh, this is the same report that has all the results that they're testifying to. We intend to ask this witness about the other EAPB that came up on this knife with blood on it, and I don't see how he can limit the testimony to just a couple of things that he tested and not include other things he tested at the same time. Uh, the credibility of this whole argument depends on how you read EAP testing and how you read the bands, and that's relevant to 118 as well, and it's, I think it's clearly fair game. <coughs> Which evidence report are we talking about? Which analyzed evidence report? Yes. It's, it's the analyzed evidence report that stated uh, 10, 18, 9, and 4. It's the one I submitted yesterday, I believe, as well. All right. I don't know anything about the facts and circumstances regarding the recovery of this alleged knife. 
It was found in uh, outside of Mr. Simpson's estate on July 2nd. Apparently it had been put there at some point after the 13th. It had a lot of blood on it. Uh, it is consistent with the wounds on the victims. It was turned over to the police and they ran the test and came up with an EAP B. And I also would like to request that the court order that that be produced tomorrow for cross-examination. Your Honor, may I correct counsel's representation to the court? There was a single thread of tiny speck of blood on the knife, on the very tip of the knife. Doesn't matter, but I'll make an offer of proof that the person who found it will testify that there was a lot of blood on it. Where was this found? It was found near a brick wall, I think toward the back of the Rockingham estate, uh, kind of down the, down the way from the, uh, I believe, the Rockingham side. It clearly hadn't been there the 13th. I mean, it was in relatively plain view, and someone had put it there. It was wrapped in a polka-dotted outfit, or a blouse, I believe, that I, I believe also had blood on it, although I don't think that was tested. Your Honor, the point of this is that it's entirely irrelevant. That's the problem. If what we have on the knife, excuse me, Mr. Blazier, if what we have on the knife is type EAPB, then obviously it's not of either of our victims. Mm -hmm. The victims in this case are BA mm -hmm. and I think BA. Is there a reason that you're arguing this rather than Mr. Uh, Goldberg? Because I looked into this uh, issue when Mr. Blazier um, informed me that he was going to be raising this issue with the court. And Mr. Goldberg was in the process of examining the witness and so wasn't, didn't have the opportunity to inform himself of the issues as I did. It's just more expeditious if I address it than if I sit and whisper in Mr. Goldberg's ear and have him address the court. So what we have is an item of evidence that is entirely irrelevant based on the testing that was done. Mm -hmm. All right, prosecution, neither side may uh, mention 118 until I uh, have some more information about where it came from, when, and what it is. Prosecution's ordered to produce that item in court tomorrow morning. Okay. And would the court also like some documentation as to the met the time and method of recovery, et cetera? Okay. Yeah, we're not going to use it till I know where it came from. Right. right. And as I indicated, this is the first first mention of this item to the court. Right. All right. May we have permission then to use a redacted copy of the analyzed evidence report at this time, uh, pending the court's further ruling? For today, yes. But I want all the reports produced tomorrow. And the item. All right, let's proceed. Let's have the jury, please. On the court's ruling, we may want, we would ask for permission to reopen if the court were going to allow this in. Because I, I, I do expect it to, to finish my direct sometime uh, today in the middle afternoon. Okay. I'll, I'll take that, uh, you know, once we see what it is, we'll see. But since I know nothing about it, and this is the first time I've been advised of the existence of this item. But I'd rather use the time with the jury to finish at least the basic blood testing. Then we'll complete direct subject to the court's determination on that yes. item. Record should reflect that we've now been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Matheson, would you resume the witness stand, please? All right, let the record reflect that Mr. Gregory Matheson is again on the witness stand undergoing direct examination by Mr. Goldberg. Good afternoon, Mr. Matheson. Good afternoon. Be reminded, sir, you were still under oath, and Mr. Goldberg, you may continue with your direct examination. Okay, we were talking about uh, erythrocyte acid phosphatase and the different phenotypes. Now, is there a particular pattern in which uh, EAP type B 
excuse me, type BA is known to degrade. Yes. What is that? Well, in, in general, the A bands are more labile or less stable, and next comes the B and the C. So in the case of the uh, type BA, <coughs> excuse me, the they're all losing uh, activity to some extent, but the A-bands being the most labile, the most sensitive to degradation, are going to disappear first before the B-bands. Uh, by the way, when a sample is deposited at a crime scene, when does the degradation process start? It starts immediately as soon as the blood leaves the body. So is it uh, common in the Los Angeles Police Department to test samples in the serology section that have some degree of degradation in them? I would say every sample, to some extent, has some degree of degradation occurring. If the uh, <laughs> degradation is to the extent where one marker <clears throat> is no longer typable, but you're still able to type another marker, say, that, say you can't type EAP, but you can still type PGM subtype, does the fact that one of the markers has been lost in any way undermine the confidence of the results in the PGM subtype? No, it doesn't. Uh, Your Honor, I, with the court's permission, I wanted the witness just to show us uh, how these items degrade by yes. drawing on this diagram. Does the court want a per permanent record of that by using the acid uh, acetate? Yes. Okay. Mr. Matheson, maybe you could step down and uh, pull the acetate over and just... As to having what? Foundation as to his knowledge regarding the manner in which these things degrade. Sir, have, have you read articles um, regarding this degradation issue with respect to the EAP? Yes, I have. When did you first become familiar with it, the issue? I first became aware of it in the class that I mentioned. I took the FBI Academy back in 1982, the degradation route of, of this particular system. And was it well known in the French community in that time? It was included as part of a curriculum, so I believe so. Okay, in addition to that kind of study about this phenomenon, EAP, have you yourself personally witnessed it as a uh, serologist working in the Los Angeles Police Department Serology Laboratory? Yes, I have. How so? There, uh, I've witnessed the phenomenon or this condition to occur in a couple of cases. I, one that comes to mind was a case in which a number of markers were run. The only difference in any of them was in the EAP system, a similar type of thing where had it been a BA, it would have been consistent with the party that we had reason to believe it came from. <laughs> uh, we got uh, results in the rest of the markers. They matched uh, the EAP exhibited a type B. Uh, which gave us concern about it, knowing that that was a degradation route. Uh, that was one example of where we feel we've seen it in case with. Okay, now I want to ask you about this degradation route, and maybe just using arrows, you could just write out what the degradation route is with respect to a type BA, how it degrades. Maybe you could just you know, write out the, the letters BA and just show us with arrows. Okay, well, here. I'm sorry, I'm staying. The phrase question. What? You said that a type BA can degrade into a B. Okay, so I'll just write a little arrow down to, to B. A BA can degrade until, until it can be look like or be confused with a B. Okay, and, and maybe I, I may have been phrasing some of my questions uh, inartfully. Does the, the type actually change, or is it the appearance that changes? Well, it's the appearance is what we are seeing as far as our development is what actually changes. Okay. So is, is this phenomenon of BA to B one that you have seen in your work and also that's been noted in the forensic science literature? Yes. Okay. But does it happen the other way around? I mean, can, can you get it to, grip, to degrade from a B to a BA? No. So there is a defined degradation route with respect to this marker? Yes, like I mentioned earlier, the A bands are the least stable, then comes the B, and then the C. Mr. Matheson, maybe you could um, 
just flip that acetate over for us. magnetic strips. Can you tell us, using the, e, the BA type phenotype on this diagram, show us how it would appear, how it would degrade to appear as a type B? Like I mentioned, the A bands in a degradation process would be the ones that would start disappearing first. So eventually you'd get to a point, notice how, how this one is significantly larger, it's the most intense in a BA Eventually, you'd have a loss of these two bands as it degrades and gets weaker. You'd also, to some extent, have some lessening in the intensity of this band. Let me just... <clears throat> okay, the first two items that you put on where you, you put cover-ups over the A bands in the VA system. Yes. And can you tell us where the, the uh, B bands in that system are, in the B band? B, yeah, it's a combination between these two, but this is the uh, major B band. So you're referring to the diagram and you just pointed to the, uh, starting from the right side of the diagram, it would be the first block and the third block. Yes. And you've covered up the second and the fourth blocks. That's correct. And uh, if, can you show us using this diagram, the comparison between the B and the BA when the A bands are? Well, again, using just the block uh, diagram showing relative locations of it, once the A bands have degraded, these stay in the same position, which are in the same position as the B bands. And you can see the relative intensities are such that the upper band. Maybe we could. Uh... 1492, are you in front of us in there? No. I can't see. Maybe we can, can look this up a little bit. <coughs> Maybe we can move this over here. Yeah. Move it up. <clears throat> Maybe with the court's permission, we could just go over this portion one more time of his testimony. Hold on. Briefly, since there's an indication that the jurors in the back row didn't see this. Let's take the uh, magnetic strips off. Now, there were two magnetic strips that you put on the type BA phenotype first. Can you do that again? Yeah, I'm going to be placing them on covering in the type BA, covering over the two A bands. And when you say A bands, does this, does this diagram indicate in some fashion that those are the A bands? Yes, right across the top of the diagram is indicated the different bands, A, B, A, and C. All right, and once the A bands are covered on the type BA, does that then begin to look like any other pattern that's contained on this chart? Yes. What pattern? Well, then you can see that the general location is still the same as the B pattern, and the relative intensities between the two bands is consistent in that the third one from the right is more intense than the first one from the right. And then you put on a third cover. Well, this is merely to indicate the degradation is occurring on all the items, so you're actually going to have some lessening of the intensity of, of this V-band. But it's still in relation to, to the other one is going to be uh, brighter, more intense. And when you see this particular pattern from a degraded BA sample, on an electrophoresis plate. Can you tell that it's been degraded by looking at the plate, or, or what does it look like? Just by looking at the plate, as long as both bands are there, no, you can't. It, it still looks like a B. And why is it that one of the bands for the type BA phenotype is under what appears to be C? Well, the, the identification of either a type B or a C is independent of its location. In other words, if you have a band that shows up in the one or the three position, uh, just the mere presence of a band doesn't indicate whether it's a B or a C or a combination of a B, C. 
It has to do with the intensity. A C, the band farthest to the right, is most intense or brightest. A B, the one towards the left, is most intense or brightest. Thank you, Mr. Stanford. So if there is a slight decrease in brightness of what you're calling the second B band on the type BA in the degraded sample that you've created with the cover-ups, why would that still be called as a type B? Well, it's just slight degradation. You'd call it a B depending on the intensity differences or relationship between the band on the far right and the third one, as long as the third one is more intense than the first one, then uh, it's a B. Okay. And is this the, the manner in which this phenomena of mistyping a BA as a B can occur? As far as my understanding, yes. <laughs> So what you are doing here is you are looking at the relative intensity on the type BA phenotype between the B in, in comparison to the band that is under where it says C. That's correct. And the existence of those two bands. Yes. What two thing, what things are you looking at other than intensity in calling the B uh, in calling the BA as, as a B? We're looking at band location in the absence of the A bands. Okay. Uh, if the A bands are not present and you have a band in what's described that there's the C column and the B column and the B one is more intense, then it's going to be called a B. It looks like a B. So if we're looking at, at the true B phenotype, which is more intense between the band under where it says C and the band under where it says B? The one under B. And is that why this is larger on the block diagram? Yes, that indicates uh, brightness or intensity. Okay, and, and then if you compare the BA degraded phenotype to the B phenotype, is the relative intensities of the respective bands the same? Yes, in that the one under the B column is brighter than the one under the C column. In both of them? That's correct. <clears throat> now, Mr. Matheson, if it is known that the EAP system has this problem, uh, why is it used for forensic testing? Well, it still has some value in that you can get information out of it. Uh, if you don't have a degraded sample, it's a very good system because of the way the different types break down, like I mentioned before, in the percentages. And it is a uh, reasonably robust system in that it is detectable uh, in stains and that type of thing. Plus, it can be analyzed along with other enzymes. There's no problem with using something like this as long as you're aware of its limitations. And what are its limitations? Just what we've been discussing in that you can get selective degradation that can cause one type to look like another one. Now, when you're doing the EAP testing, do you have to consume any additional sample in order to run this test? <laughs> it depends on how you run it. There are what are called single systems where when you run your electrophoresis plate, the only thing that you analyze for is, say, the EAP system. In this particular case, and with procedures that we have in place in our laboratory, we have a system that allows us to run PGM subtyping and EAP using the exact same sample, the exact same gel, so it doesn't use any more sample to uh, get this information. So in this particular case, were you able to get the EAP information without consuming any additional sample. That's correct. Over and above what you were using in PGM subtyping. Correct. And why is that of concern as to how much sample you're using? Well, that's always a concern when it comes to forensic serology. You don't want to use any more than necessary. You preserve as much of the sample for either retesting 
or uh, confirmation at a later time. All right. Now I'd like to uh, return to the serology results board. Now, Mr. Matheson, what, was, what were the EAP results on the reference files uh, in this case? The results on item number 17, uh, reference blood marks coming from Mr. Simpson, EAP type BA. Item number 59 from Nicole Brown, EAP type BA. And item number 60, Mr. Goldman, it's an EAP type A. Now, If the suspect in a case is a type BA and you have run the test and it looks like a B when you run the test, does that include or exclude the suspect? It ex excludes. Now, given the known degradation issue that you talked about with respect to the BA type, can you say that the suspect did not contribute that sample? Well, in and on the face, if you know for a fact that it is a type B and cannot be a degradation product, then yes, it does in fact exclude them. If you cannot totally eliminate the fact that a degradation did occur, then you can't use that as an absolute excluder. So if you cannot eliminate the possibility of degradation, is a type B result an exclusion of a suspect who is type BA? It's not an absolute exclusion, no. Uh, you just have to keep in mind that you are seeing a B, but a degraded BA is a possibility. Now, at this time, I'd like to mark a copy of the analyzed evidence report. It's People's 218 for identification. All right, analyzed evidence report. What's the date on the report? <clears throat> this is uh, page three of the report that was dated September, was it 18? September 18. September 18. And I'm going to put a uh, 217 on the reverse side of that. Excuse me, October 18th. This is 218. 218. Have to lower the serology results board again. While he's doing that, Mr. Matheson, did you do some testing on the uh, fingernail scrapings, some fingernail scrapings, item number 84 A and B? Yes, I did. All right. And I want to ask you some questions about your report as to the results on those items. Can we see the, the paragraph that says 84 A and B? Yes, I do. And does that relate your findings with respect to the uh, fingernail scrapings underneath uh, the, the fingernails on uh, 84 A and B? It's a narrative explanation of the results, yes. And can you tell us what you wrote there as, as depicted on this particular report, if you can read yes. it off the screen? It uh, says item number 84A and 84B could not have come from Nicole Brown Simpson, Ronald Gorman, or O.J. Simpson. 
period. However, Nicole Brown Simpson cannot be excluded as a source of the stain if the EAP type B observed on the items were degraded from a type BA. All right. So would it be a fair reading of the report if someone were to say that this categorically excluded Nicole Brown Simpson, Ronald Goldman, or O.J. Simpson of being a donor of the uh, material underneath the fingernail? Well, it categorically excludes two of them. It does not absolutely exclude uh, Nicole Simpson or Nicole Brown. What about Nicole Brown? Okay. okay. Now, when you wrote that second sentence that Nicole Brown could not be excluded as a possible donor, why did you write that? The reason that it's in there is, first off, there's two markers that were identified on those items, the PGM subtype and the EAP. I uh, used the PGM subtype to eliminate the other two parties involved. That left... Uh, Nicole Brown, and then this issue, knowing that a BA can be degraded into a B, I wanted to include that in there so that there was no confusion as to an absolute statement of exclusion on her part. That's fine. Let me, let's see the uh, serology results port, maybe hold up a little bit. A little bit. Okay, now you were saying that you could exclude uh, of the three individuals that we have the reference files for, everyone except Nicole Brown, as to item number. Uh, 84 A and B, the nail scrapings. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, using this chart, can you show us where the PGM subtype result is for the fingernail scrapings 84 A and 84 B? Well, if you go across in the column marked 84 A, 84 B, there's two empty squares, and then you get a notation of a one plus. That is under the column marked PGM subtype. Right, and, and why do you say that you can exclude? Orenthal Simpson as being a donor of that particular material? Because in the PGM subtype system, he is a 2 plus, 2 minus, and the result obtained on those was a 1 plus. So in, in reporting that, have you uh, looked at our chart and compared the 1 plus under 84 A and B to the 2 plus, 2 minus under 17 Orenthal Simpson? Yes, I did. And you can point with the pointer so we, we can all see where you're looking at these. Okay, the results on the two evidence items, 84A and 84B, are in this column right here. Like I described before, uh, three over from the item description, a one plus and a one plus. And up on the top, under the same column, PGM subtype, opposite item number 17, is the notation two plus, two minus. And can you tell us how it is that Ronald Goldman can be excluded as a donor of 84 A and B? It's in the same system. The two evidence items, again, gave us a 1 plus and a 1 plus. Uh, Mr. Goldman was a 2 plus, 1 plus. So in the absence of the 2 plus here, he can be eliminated as a source of the blood. And why is it that you cannot eliminate Nicole Brown as being a source of the blood? Again, on the nail scrapings, the PGM subtype is a one plus in both instances, and she was found to be a PGM subtype one plus. Okay, but what about the difference in EAP type? Well, as noted in the report, initially she is excluded. However, we also have to consider the fact that BA can degrade to look like a B. So on face value, on the results that were obtained, she can be excluded. However, taking into account the degradation route of that particular enzyme, I would not do a total exclusion on her. 
I'd like to mark as people's next in order an electrophoresis worksheet that contains uh, a reference to 84A and B. So 219 on the reverse side of this. Now, sir, what is the document that we're looking at now? What you're seeing is kind of an enlarged portion of a section of a worksheet that we have. It's called electrophoresis worksheet. And was part of this document filled out by you? Uh, all except for a couple of initials was filled out by myself. Now, with uh, respect to the 85A and 85B results, Excuse me, 84A and 84B results. Uh, that's the fingernail scrapings that we're talking about. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Now, what did you write on the electrophoresis worksheet when you filled out this document with respect to those results? Okay, under the column that's marked EAP, there's two rows of letters. The one on the left is the row that I put in when I first read the plate. And opposite, you go from the left to the right reading, it's got the DR number associated with this case, 84A and 84B on those two lines. You'll notice that the first column under EAP has a B with a question mark on it. Is that what you wrote? Yes, it is. What does the question mark signify? Because I see you have it in a number of places. It indicates that on my first reading, uh, I wasn't sure. It looked like a B, but I wasn't absolutely positive of it. And why is it that you uh, had that question in your mark, that co the question in your mind that caused you to put the question mark on the electrophoresis worksheet? Well, on this particular item, I believe the bands were on the light side and kind of diffuse. They were a little fuzzy. They just weren't good looking bands. Maybe I can just put our EAP block diagram. It's not going to work. I'm going to have to learn how to put this easel. Mr. Matheson, when you looked at the electrophoresis plate when you were testing item 84, A and B, uh, with respect to, to the bands at the end that, that all of the phenotypes share in common, were those present? I believe in the case of at least one, if not both of them, that band was either very weak or not present at all. 
can, can you show us what it looked like using the block diagram uh, and the magnet? Well, basically, it would, it would have bands in the area consistent with the standards for the two B bands, and then this area up here was there was nothing present. What are those bands called? The bands that all of the items share in common that are represented on the left side of the EAP phenotype board? I've always understood them to be called storage bands. And is there any diagnostic significance to them in terms of trying to figure out what the item in question is? They have no bearing on what the type is, no. But in this particular case, that band was not there? I don't believe so, no. What else about the uh, bands look strange to you or different to you that caused you to write the question mark? No, they were just not very distinct. They're on the light side, and they were not very obvious distinct bands. And when you uh, wrote the analyzed evidence report, do you why don't you just simply transpose whatever's on the analyzed on the uh, electrophoresis worksheet onto the uh, analyzed evidence report and call it as a B question mark. Well, like I previously mentioned, this is a worksheet. It's something that's created during the course of our reading the bands. Uh, these plates are never run or read alone. You always have somebody co-read it, and that's what the second column is for. And then the information that's put on the final report is the final conclusion of what is is seen to be present. Now, when you are uh, testing a blood sample and you get a result from a known, if you got a result from a known blood sample that you knew to be type BA blood that was identical to the result that you got in 84A and 84B, in this case, how would it be called? If I understand the question right, you're saying I have two samples, one of which I know is a type BA? Well, let's, let's say you have, you have one sample, let's say it's from someone in your laboratory that you're using as a reference sample, and they're a known type BA. Yet when you test it, you get the same result that you got on 84A and 84B. It would be an indication that that blood has degraded, that we have a problem with it. Okay. How would you call it, though? Well, in this case, I know what it's supposed to be, and I would not call a result from that. But would it look the same in appearance, or could it look the same in appearance as to what you saw in 84A and 84B? Okay. 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 Could degraded blood, BA blood, give the same appearance as what you saw? Yes, it could. Now, is there any, when you're making your call for the purposes of your report, do you consider at that time anything other than what you saw on the plate itself? Not as far as the result that's put down, no. And why is that? Because that's the result. You know, when, when you have something that is present, particularly in the case of electrophoresis, on the plate, it is readable, it's giving a type, then that is the type that needs to be reported. And what about the suggestion by some analysts that uh, you should also take into account the history and the origin of the stain? Do you do that at that particular point in time? To some extent, that's why the second part of that paragraph, initially excluding, but then with the um, proviso of the fact that it, it is only exclusion if it's not a degraded sample. So at the time that you wrote that paragraph, did you take the step of taking a look or trying to take a look at the history and origin of the sample in question, 84A and 84B? Well, the main fact that I took into account is where the sample came from, and that was uh, under the victim's fingernails. Okay. Did you take a look at any crime scene photographs at that time, at the time you wrote your report? Not at the time I'd written the report, but I have seen many photographs of the scene. Since then? Since then and prior to then, yes. Okay. Now, 
<clears throat> in, in terms of looking at the history and origin of the uh, stain, from a forensic science standpoint, is there anything else that can be done in order to resolve the issue of 84A and 84B uh, by looking at other samples at the crime scene? Well, there is some information that can be derived from that. And specifically what? <coughs> uh, the, the looking at other evidence items that were collected, particularly those where we feel we know the source of the blood sample. All right, and did you do that in this case prior to uh, testifying today? Yes, I did. Let me just take that. <coughs> Basis Overrule at this point. Mr. Matheson, while we're, we're putting that up, the, the date on the analyzed evidence report relating the findings on uh, 84 A and B was, uh, was what? The date analysis completed on that report is October 18th, 1994. Okay. Right, like you have to be careful, you almost got number one there. <laughs> Chair number one, would it be better if we moved everybody down in one seat? Would that be more comfortable for you? You're okay? All right. Now, uh, Mr. Matheson, directing your attention to the um, diagram that we've just put up, that says Bundy Drive biological evidence. It's People's 165 for identification. Uh, have you looked at the uh, photographs relating item number 42, which is at the bottom, the third photograph from the right? Yes, I have. And uh, was it your understanding from the uh, crime scene photographs that this was the area in which Nicole Brown had been located prior to her body being removed? Yes. Now, did you also hear any evidence to the effect that when that stain was recovered that Mr. Fung described it as being tacky? No, I didn't. Well, if I were to tell you that, that there was some evidence to that effect, would the fact that it was tacky have any significance from a, a standpoint of the um, amount of degradation you would expect in that area? Well, using the term tacky by him and given the time that it, well, first off, it, tacky to me would mean that it had not dried <laughs> as opposed to some of the other samples that were present. And that being liquid is one of the worst conditions for biological samples as far as degradation goes. So if that sample was tacky at the point it was collected, it means that it had been damp uh, for an extended period of time, and potentially some degradation has been occurring. Why is it that wet samples are more likely to, to uh, degrade than dry samples? It allows the degradation process to occur much more quickly. That's the environment that it likes to occur in. Okay. And uh, would it be uh, proper to take into account testing that you did? Well, first of all, did you do some testing on item 42? Yes, I did. And would it be proper to take into account test results that you got on that in resolving the issue of the fingernail scrapings, 84A and B? Objection, no comment. So, Stan, we the question. Uh, in the forensic science literature, is there any recommendation of looking at 
a pool of the victim's blood or blood on her clothing and resolving de degradation issues. Looking at blood that's known to come from a victim, yes, there is. Why is that? Because it is blood that it leaves the body around the time that the event occurred. It is known to be that person's. It's kind of like a reference sample that enters the environment at the same time as the evidence samples. To your knowledge, was item 42 collected as a circumstantial re uh, reference sample of the victim's blood? Yes, it was. And from a forensic science standpoint, would it be appropriate to look at test results on that blood for the purposes of resolving what was happening under the fingernails? It wouldn't resolve it, but it would allow some additional information to be obtained, yes. Why is that? Well, because it is blood that is believed to be the victim's, given its location and quantity, and like I mentioned earlier, entered the environment at the same time as the rest of the blood samples at the scene are relatively close to the same time. And thus it should reflect the types that we get in the exemplar samples, the reference samples that are taken from that person. Would you expect uh, the blood in item number 42 to have been exposed to the same environmental conditions as the blood under the fingernails? To some extent. I've Oh, well. Obviously, they're not in the exact same spot. There's going to be some slight variations, but the general temperature of the area is the same, the humidity and that type of thing. And uh, directing your attention now to item number 57, which is described as being a label, and the call out line uh, is, has been testified to as being in the area of where Nicole Simpson's body would have been. Uh, did you also do some testing on that? Yes, I did. And similarly, if that were located in an area uh, that contained pooling of what appeared to be the victim's blood, could you also take a look at 57 the same way that you described with respect to 42? Uh, not exactly the same. It's not in the immediate area. It's a little bit further away. We're starting to get a little bit more separated. Uh, the fact that it is directly connected or, or in relation to a pool uh, would add some weight to being able to use it for more additional information. All right. And with respect to item number 54, uh, for identification, which is in the area of the gate. There's a photograph of, of criminalist Mazzola in the lower right-hand corner and a call-out lo line showing where that came from. Uh, would that item, would you expect that to have been subject to the same uh, environmental conditions as the blood under the fingernails and on the pool? Oh, well. Oh, well. It appears that that sample is up on the gate. It's going to be subjected to the same general environmental as far as weather conditions and such. However, the fact that it is separated from the rest, it appears to be kind of an isolated spot, probably dried faster, would be an indication that the conditions were not exactly the same. So the fact that it dried faster would mean what? Less likely to have any form of de or the extent of degradation to samples that were still wet. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to mark the uh, what we've called the fingernail or nail scraping board, Your Honor, which had some graphic or one graphic photograph on it. A board we'll put over here. All right, number 220. I have an objection, uh, foundational objection I would like to approach on. As to the nail board? Yes. All right, with the court put
All right, thank you, Council. Proceed. All right, Mr. Bancroft, this has a uh, victim's photo on it. I don't want any still photos of this item. Madam reporter, uh, excuse me, would you uh, contact Ms. Hazlett? I hear the remote camera going off. Mr. Goldberg. Yes. Proceed. Thank you. Now, Mr. Matheson, uh, directing your attention to the exhibit that we just put up, the nail clippings, scrapings, and of Nicole uh, Brown. Your, your Honor, may I uh, put these photographs on the Elmo? On the uh, overhead? Yes. All right, because I, I, I want to put the middle photograph on first. Your feet is kind of the two side photographs. Why don't you go ahead and work with the exhibit as you have it here. Uh, Mr. Matheson, directing your attention to the middle photograph um, on this board on the bottom. Have you looked at that crime scene photograph before? Yes, I have. And assuming that this is an accurate representation of uh, the location of the body when the police arrived and photographed it and uh, the blood area underneath the body. Can you tell us why it would be proper to take a look at your results on item 42 in providing more information about the fingernail scrapings? There is obviously a large quantity of blood present uh, from the victim, both uh, in the immediate area and in and around her hands. And does it appear from this photograph that her hands are in contact with the, uh, or at least her right hand is in contact with the pool of blood. 
Part of it is, yes, here's the back. Now, looking at the photograph on the le right of the sport of the left hand, excuse me, right hand. No, that's the, okay, well, we'll, we'll look at the left hand, okay. Right hand. Um, have you looked at this photograph? Yes, I have. And does this photograph help to explain why you feel it would be proper to look at what was happening with your testing on 42? Oh, it helps point out that there is a large quantity of victim's blood present in and around the hand. And next, looking at the left hand photograph. Have you looked at that? Yes. And again, does that help to uh, describe why you feel it would be proper to look at what was happening on stain 42? Yes. Why is that? For the same reason. The, there's a large amount of blood present on the victim's hands, uh, presumably from the victim. Now, next, I'd like to look at the uh, photograph that says right hand fingernail scrapings. I think we're going to have to use the Elmo for that. Now, Mr. Matheson, does, is this the uh, coroner's packet from which you took the items that you tested as 84A, excuse me, as 84? Yes, it is. And can you tell us what portion of that you used? On opening up the package, there would be a small amount of debris that would be located in the package from the scrapings. That's what they are. They take the stick and they scrape under the nails and scrape into a bindle. So you'd have a little bit of debris down inside of it. What did this look like? Like small chunks of blood. It's difficult to see them in this. Can you see any of those chunks left in, in this photograph? So it's hard to say. There are some specks. Mainly there are some, some scrapings where the wet blood had been scraped off of the stick onto the paper. Now, did you notice when you saw the bindle, the, uh, what appears to be red or brown stains on the bindle? On the inside of it, yes. What, what significance, if any, does that have? Well, it suggests that the blood was probably damp at the time the scrapings were made and wiped off on the inside of there. And is that significant from a standpoint of trying to learn more about what happened to the blood under the fingernails? Well, like previously mentioned, it's a damp condition that, that most uh, hastens degradation. And if it was still damp when these are taken, it means it had been damp for quite a while. Now let's take a look at the left hand fingernail scrapings photograph. <coughs> Now, on this particular photograph, can you see some of the specs or any specs that are consistent with what you tested? Yes. Can you point them out for us? There appears to be captured in the little fold here of the bindle, little black specs that would be dried chunks of blood. Is that, that what you saw at the time that you opened up the bindle and uh, tested a portion of the specs in that bindle? Yes. Now, did you ever see in either of the bindles anything that looked like tissue or skin? I did not see any, no. Okay, thank you. Now, with respect to the other photographs that are of the fingernails or appear to be of the fingernails themselves, uh, does it appear that there is staining of blood on the underside of the fingernails? There's very heavy staining on the right hand nail clippings, and there is some lighter but definite staining on what appears to be three of the nails marked as left hand fingernail clippings. And the right hand was the hand in the, in the photograph that is in closest contact with the pool of blood? Yes. Let's just take a quick look at the left hand fingernail clippings, if we can. And there's also some staining on what appears to be the uh, left hand fingernail clippings. That's correct, on at least three of them. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> Thank you.
Your Honor, is it possible to use the serology results chart simultaneously to the Bundy board, or does the court want us to? Well, I want counsel for both sides to be able to see the object that we're working with is the problem. Okay, well, maybe can we, can we uh, set up the easel here, for example, so that the counsel can see it at the same time? The problem is then we get away from the jury. So I, I guess you're sort of, given the size of these monsters, I think you're sort of stuck with one or the other. Well, let's just try putting, why don't we try putting the Bundy, the uh, serology results board over the biological evidence board to make it easier to shift back and forth. Now, Mr. Matheson, taking a look now at item 42. Mr. Fertlow, can we get that up just a tad? Great, thank you. On item 42 in your analyzed evidence report, how was that called? I'm referring to my report, under the EAP, item number 42 was called inconclusive. And this report is dated when? The completion date of October 18th, 1994. That's the same report that we previously discussed when we were discussing 84A and 84B? Yes. Okay, now, on the uh, serology electrophoresis uh, worksheet, what did you put on that worksheet when you were discussing the EAP results on 42? I'd like to refer to that sheet. Sure. And maybe you can also look at the item description, the serology description note too. Okay, for item number 42 under the EAP on the electrophoresis worksheet, one reading that I made was of a B question mark ink or inconclusive. The secondary reading from another criminalist was as a no activity. No. The, the information that I transferred over to the summary sheet was of a B question mark and then the notation very weak with an INC for inconclusive. Okay, now why did you put both a question mark and an INC on this result? Oh, it's just, it's an indication to me that it is, it's a very questionable result. What's the difference between a question mark and an INC? But de depends on where it's written. I mean, INC or inconclusive is kind of the final decision based on the other information, the question mark is put there as an indication to me that, that I'm not sure of what it is. All right. Now, what did you see when you uh, ran the sample, item number 42? What could you actually see on the electrophoresis plate? I saw two very weak bands in the general area of where I would expect to see the two B bands, with the top one being slightly darker than the bottom, but they were very weak and real kind of fuzzy or whatever, it, it, it was not a band, it was just kind of a haze in that area. But were there in fact two perceptible, although hazy, bands in the area where you expect to see the two B bands? Well, there, there was two something going on there. They weren't really bands, but there was something occurring in those two areas. All right, and what did that indicate to you, Mr. Matheson? 
Well, just like I said, that I, I had the two bands or appearance of bands in the general area where a B should occur, which is why I put the B question mark, but it was nowhere near something that I would call was why it became inconclusive. Now, with respect to the um, reference uh, sample on uh, Nicole Brown's blood, that was a BA, is that correct? Yes. So when you, when you tested item 42, did you see any evidence of the A bands? No, I did not. So what happened to them? Well, going off the assumption that item 42 was in fact collected as a secondary exemplar reference sample, it should have come back to be a BA, just like the reference sample that was received from her from the coroner's office. So it appears that 42 degraded to the point where the A bands were no longer visible and almost degraded to the point where the or you know lack of sensitivity where the bees were starting to fade away to nothing. Okay, and what significance, if any, does that have in terms of understanding what was happening on 84A and B, the nail scrapings? Well, the significance is, is the phenomena or the situation that is known to exist with the EAP system, and that is this degradation route of a BA to a B, I did in fact occur in a, uh, or is possibly occurring because of the inconclusive, in a situation regarding a sample at this scene. Okay, well, let me ask you this. If you have a situation at a crime scene where the victim is lying in a pool of her own blood, and that blood, her pool of blood, is shown to have degraded from a type BA to the point that it contains two very faint bands, which are most consistent with a B. And then you also have uh, fingernail scrape. What, what can you say about the uh, material underneath the fingernails that appears to be most consistent with a B? Overall. Well, like I just mentioned, the fact that you do have what appears to be degradation occurring in a sample that we know uh, came from a person of a certain type, this phenomenon has shown that you know it does appear that it's existing even at this location. It applies uh, some reason that you can carry this through potentially to other items in the uh, uh, that were collected in the same vicinity at uh, roughly the same time. Okay. All right, let's move on. If I can understand uh, what you're saying. I, I think I think we've asked this question in about eight different forms now. I know, but it's about it's a, how it degrades. It's, we, a, it's a little complex, and I just want to make sure I understand what Mr. Matheson is saying. Well, we're saying. not here to see if you understand, counsel. We're here to see if the jury understands. Okay. And we've heard this question in eight different forms now. Okay. Let's now, move on. Mr. Matheson, with respect to um, the item number that's labeled... Uh, 57 that was uh, described as, as having come from the uh, area just east of where the body was. What were your results on that? Referring again to my report, the results for the EAP on item number 15, 57 were inconclusive. And according to your electrophoresis worksheet, what were the results? In the first column has a B question mark, INC. Second column is just INC for inconclusive. And on that particular sample, what did that one look like? If I called it a B, inconclusive or a B question mark, that means that there was something appearing in the two areas of the B bands, or I expect to see B bands with the one, the B region being more intense than the C. Now, with respect to item number 57, did you get a result off the PGM subtype? Yes, I did. What was that? A one plus. And is it proper to take a look at what was happening on that item 57 in the EAP? enzyme system to determine or to provide more information about what was happening under the fingernails. 
sustain. Sir, did you consider uh, this result in providing more information in terms of what was happening under the fingernails? Now, as far as item 57, it didn't come much into play when it uh, came into consideration of the fingernail scrapings. Okay, but the PGM subtype would be consistent with the victim, yet the, the EAP inconclusive would be inconsistent theoretically. If that inconclusive result was a conclusive result, then it would be, would be not consistent with the victim in this. Does that tend to show that at this crime scene there is degradation of the EAP marker from a, a BA to a B. Does, does that tend to show that there was degradation on this particular sample, item 57, at this crime scene? Sustained. What does that show in terms of degradation on this sample, item 57? Oh, no. Well, just the inconclusive in and of itself, regardless of the type, indicates that either some sort of degradation is occurring or there's just not enough sample to get a result. And does the B provide any more information? Not in and of itself, no. Okay. Now, with respect to um, item 85, did you also do some testing on that? Yes, I did. And what testing did you do on item 85? I did the same electrophoretic run uh, as previously described, that included the PGM subtype and the EAP. What was the result of the PGM subtype on item 85? Well, there are actually two separate stains that are marked 85, 85A and 85B. Uh, in both instances, the PGM subtype was a one plus. And what did you write down, not in the, in, in the analyzed evidence report, but on the electrophoresis worksheets? as to the result on the EAP. This is for item number 85A and B? Yes. The column that recorded my initial results was a B with an A question mark. The column of the second reader, the other criminalist, was a BA. Okay, so the second criminalist called that as a BA? Yes. Why were you not willing to call that as a BA? If you remember the, the bands that we showed in the chart, with a BA we should have four bands of basically certain types of intensities. I've seen a number of these type of samples over the years, and the A bands were significantly weaker than I would have expected them to be in a classic BA, given the intensity of the B bands. Can you exclude this, or could you exclude this as being certain other phenotypes of the common EAP phenotypes? The EAP on 85A and B? Yes. Well, the fact that there were bands in the A region, assuming it's not a mixture, it could not just be a B, it could not just be a CB, and it could not just be a C. And given the intensities, it is probably not a CA. And there are five common uh, phenotypes. Was it five? I believe was there was six. six. Okay. So could it be any of the common phenotypes other than? Could it be any of the other common phenotypes other than BA? Not if uh, it's a sole sample, no. Now, does this uh, test result provide any additional information with respect to what was happening on the fingernail sample? It could. And was that? Well, in this particular sample, I don't know for a fact what the original source of the blood is. However, I am getting four bands that are in the positions and, and relative sensitivities of a BA. The difference here is, is that the A bands are significantly weaker. If it is blood from a single source, it had to have started out as a BA, but those A bands have started to degrade or lose sensitivity. If they had gone any further, we would have a situation where the BA, again, would start looking like a B. So on this particular sample, if the A bands had in fact degraded somewhat more than they were, what would have you called it as? Then I would have called it as a B. And 
why would have that been called as a B if the A bands had degraded to the point where you could no longer detect them? Because all that would be left would be the two bands that appear in the region where you expect to see the B bands, one band being properly greater intensity than the other. So, Mr. Matheson, based upon the totality of your results that you've discussed with this EAP enzyme and also the viewing of the crime scene photographs, do you have an opinion as to whether the fingernail scrapings were in fact a true B or more likely to have been a true B or more likely to have originally been a BA that degraded into a B? Given everything, including the results, I would say it's more likely than not that that blood was in fact a BA, that it's the victim's blood. However, I cannot totally exclude the possibility that it is a EAP type B. And what is the basis of that opinion that it's more probably the victim's blood? Well, like we just said, looking at the photos, a lot of the victim's blood present. If we were just to look at that and not do an analysis on it, I think common sense would tell you that that's going to be the victim's blood under her own fingernails. However, that's not a terribly scientific approach. We still run the test. We don't assume what it is. The test came up with this type B. That is, in fact, what was seen on the gel, so it cannot be totally discounted, but I would say there's a very high likelihood that that is the victim's blood under the nails. Now, given the results that you've discussed so far as to the fingernail scrapings and the other items that we've talked about in terms of EAP, is there anything further that can be done from a forensic science standpoint in order to try to provide even more information on this issue? Yes, there is. And what's that? continue to run additional tests. Find out if if you can, in fact, exclude the victim under another system. And are you talking about conventional or are you talking about DNA tests? Well, you could do both. However, more information would be derived from subjecting it to DNA typing. And to your knowledge, was this one of the samples that was, in fact, sent out for DNA testing? Yes, it was. Now, in the opinions that you've expressed in court, have you considered any DNA results, or are your opinions based exclusively on the testing that you did in the photographs that you viewed? It's been strictly on the information that I have regarding my own testing and, and the uh, photographs and conditions. I did not consider any sort of DNA results. All right. All right, Mr. Goldberg, would this be a good spot? It would be, Your Honor. Thank All you. right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a uh, brief recess to... Uh, for the court reporters, please remember my admonitions to you, and we'll reconvene in 15 minutes. Mr. Matheson, you're to turn 15 minutes. Thank you. And there's again on the witness stand undergoing direct examination by Mr. Goldberg. Mr. Matheson, you're reminded again that you're still under oath, and Mr. Goldberg, you may conclude your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Matheson, does the serology results board that we've been discussing contain uh, the results on every single item that you tested, or just some of them? Just some of them. For instance, did you test a item uh, 115 through 117? Yes, I did. And did you uh, get any test results? Did you get any results on that, or was that an inconclusive from your analyzed evidence report? You're referring to my analyzed evidence report for item number 115, 116, and 117. I got no activity for all three items in the PGM subtype system and inconclusive for all three items in the EAP system. Okay. And those, uh, to your information, were uh, stains on the uh, rear gate at the Bundy location? Or don't yes. you know? All right. Now, in a stain that was, if we assume for the, for the sake of, uh, of uh, your testimony that 116, 115, and 117, you can sort of see them on the uh, left side of the Bundy board, were in fact located at the uh, Bundy location but not collected until July the 3rd. Would you expect there to be more degradation on the conventional markers of the kind that you typed than on other stains that were collected on the... Uh, 13th of June. 
sustain? Sir, do, do environmental conditions uh, cause some degradation on dry stains as, as well as wet stains? Yes, the best way to store it is frozen and dry. Okay. And would you expect there to be some degradation on the conventional markers in those stains between uh, July the 13th and, excuse me, June the 13th and July the 3rd? If they were not stored frozen, yes. Now, with respect to uh, 117, when you uh, tested that item, did you notice anything about the way that the swatches were contained inside the bindle? Yes, I did. What was that? That when I first opened it up, I, it appeared like there was just one swatch present in the bindle. But upon closer examination and peeling them apart, there was actually, I believe, three. Now, you t testified earlier about an inventory that you did in uh, June, I think it was June the 29th of last year, is that correct? Yes. And did you have 17, 15, 16, and 7, excuse me, 115, 116, and 117 for that interview, uh, for that uh, examination? No, I did not. All right. <clears throat> Now, you've also, uh, we've also asked you some questions about the reference vial, uh, item number 17. Over the noon hour, did you fill up some reference vials with a colored liquid, uh, some vacutainer reference vials? Yes, I did. And, Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to mark as people's next in order. It's 2... 221. 21. Maybe I can do it as A and B. Right. Uh, 221A appears to be the more full of the two vials. All right, you show these to Mr. Blazier? Yes. So I've marked uh, the, the less full of the two vials as 221B. Um, Mr. Matheson showing you 221 A and B. Are these the vials that you filled with water uh, at the noon hour? Yes, they are. Is, is there some kind of food coloring? Is this a biological sample in here? No, it is not. Is, is, is there food coloring or something in there just to make it easier to see? Yes. All right. Uh, I'd like to show you these two vials. And can you tell us... <clears throat> starting with 221A, uh, what you did in order to create that demonstration exhibit. Sustain. Sir, are these, uh, these are vacutainer vials, is that correct? That's the brand name of them, yes. And are those approximately the same size as the monoject, monoject vials that are also used, purple top vials? They appear to be, yes. Okay. Briefly, yes, let I, me, I agree. Uh, let me just show you defense 1124 for identification. Can you just take a, a look and, and compare the monojet with the uh, vacutainer? I was just doing a visual comparison of the monojet brand to the vacutainer brand. The monojet appears to be maybe a 16th of an inch shorter, and the diameter appears to be roughly the same. Can you maybe you can just rest them on the uh, I mean, stand them up on the counter just so we, you, we can see the, okay. the height comparison. Placing them side by side on the counter, so the glass is on the bottom, the monoject stopper is partially extended. It isn't all the way seated, but it appears that they're very similar in, in height and circumference. Sir, and when you uh, looked at the vial, were you actually looking to see whether it was a vacutainer as opposed to a monojet, or are all these purple top vials, as far as you're concerned, uh, the same? Talking about when I looked at it on the 29th? Yeah. No, I wasn't looking at the brand name, just the fact there was a purple cap vial of about this size. So on the 29th, did you make certain assumptions with respect to how large purple top vial is? Yes. What was your assumption? That it was 
a 10 milliliter tube, and that is that full, it would hold 10 milliliters of liquid. What was the assumption based on? I'm, I'm not sure. It's just an assumption I've held for many years. Hey, have you ever tried to test it by filling up a, a vacutainer or a monojet to, to see exactly how much it holds? No. Has that ever been a pertinent issue uh, in any of your past case work? No, it is not. Now, with respect to the vacutainer tubes that you filled up, can you tell us what you did? Okay, in both instances, I took the caps off of them. I was supplied with from the laboratory a pipetter like I described earlier. This particular one can deliver exactly one milliliter of fluid. So I set it to one milliliter, and in the one that was marked 20 or 221A, I delivered 3.8 milliliters of fluid, three thousands. Or can, you, can you hold that up so the jurors can see the amount of fluid in there? <laughs> Basically delivering, you know, three one milliliter portions and then 1.8 milliliter portion. In the other one, which is marked as 221B, I delivered two one milliliter portions or a total of t two mils, two milliliters. Well, how do you know that the portions of water that you used in order to fill these vials were accurately measured? I was using a, a pipetter that uh, is calibrated to those amounts. Okay, are the dispo pipetters or disposable pipetters calibrated? The glass ones that I was describing yeah. earlier? No, they are not. Okay, and those were the ones that you use when you're uh, actually doing your testing? Yes. Um, now, can you hold up those two vials next to each other so the jurors can get a sense of the difference between the two? Mr. Matheson, as to uh, the vial that's 221B for identification, the, uh, the I'm sorry, A, the, the larger of the two vials. Can you, let me ask another question first. On uh, June the 29th, did you have an assumption as to where the five milliliter point would be on this type of purple topped vial? Yes, I did. What was your assumption? That if this is a 10 milliliter tube, the five milliliter point would be at about the halfway point on the tube. Can you write in the, uh, maybe you can just make a mark in the area that you would have assumed to be a five milliliter point. Oh, uh, just, and just doing an approximation, going from the top of the tube to about the halfway point, I would see it as right about where I've drawn that line. You see, you've just drawn a line across the tube. Is that on the glass or on the label? I drew it on the label. All right. And Mr. Matheson, uh, based upon that assumption, if you, if you were to assume it was correct, how much would you estimate is in that vial? Well, looking at it right now, based on that, I'd say about two and a half milliliters. And in fact, it has how much? 3.8. So your assumption based upon the halfway point is 1.3 milliliters off? Yes. And why is it that you've never <clears throat> done any experiments like this before? It's just never been an issue. I've never needed to worry exactly how much blood was in a tool, tube. Why don't you need to worry about that? Haven't we covered this line already? Okay. P perhaps we could pass the tubes around, though, so that the charts could get a better look.
sort of based upon the assumption in 221A as to the midway point, uh, would you say that you could be off by at least 1.3 milliliters in estimating these tubes? I thought we asked that question. Well, I think I asked a little bit differently, and it might have been ambiguous. Oh, too bad. Okay. okay. Now, Mr. Matheson, as a result of this little experiment that you did, um, have you come to any conclusions regarding the accuracy of trying to guesstimate what's in one of these non-graduated purple top tubes? For guesstimate. Sustain. Rephrase the question. Well, for you, when you are looking, when you looked at one of these uh, purple top tubes on the 29th, would you describe what you were doing as being an estimate or a guesstimate? That was definitely a very rough estimate. Okay, and, and have you come to any conclusions with respect to how accurate uh, your estimate was? Yes. What? That it was not very accurate at all. Okay. Now, I'd like to mark, uh, we've already marked as uh, people's 210 for identification and exhibit. Perhaps we could put that up. The, I'm going to come back to these serology results, so I, I don't know whether it's possible to put it over there. Okay. He's getting that chart, Mr. Matheson. I wanted to ask you about some testimony, though, from the preliminary hearing on page 39, line 25, through page 40, line 3. Two seconds. It's page 30, 39 through 40. Did you have that? Uh, okay. Page 39, line 25 through 40, line 3. Uh, Mr. Matheson, do you recall giving the following answers to the following questions at the preliminary hearing? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to have to back up to line 22 for the question. Uh, question, with respect to the sample of item number 17, the blood vial of O.J. Simpson, did you similarly inventory how much of that sample you consumed? Answer, the proportion that would be consumed would have been, O, a stain of well consisting of significantly less than one drop out of the vial, which when I received it had about two milliliters of blood in it. So it would have been an insignificant quantity to the amount that was present. Question, thank you. Do you recall giving that answer to that question, sir? Yes, I do. And what did you mean by the portion that you consumed would have been significantly less than one drop out of the vial? and describing it as an insignificant quantity. At that point, I've been referring strictly to the electrophoretic work. The uh, gels, that type of thing, uses a very small amount of blood and either forgetting about or not including the uh, ABO typing. Okay. Were you referring to any uh, materials that were clinging to the sides of the pipettes or the microcentrifuge tubes? Or were you even thinking about that at the time? But didn't even dawn on me. I was just talking about the actual amount of sample that was used during testing. And where did the figure of the two <clears throat> milliliters, had about two milliliters, come from? That's consistent with the uh, estimate that I made on that inventory. Okay. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to uh, People's 210 for identification. Uh, what is represented on, on this board? Let's start with the outside packaging. What does that represent? That is a 
white analyzed evidence envelope that's used to store evidence items for freezer storage. And these are marked to contain items 334 through 336. Now, what is uh, the package marked item 47, 50, and 78? What are those? What is shown in those pictures are a coin envelope or a manila coin envelope that's used to hold an evidence item along with the bindle, a little white paper bindle that the actual swatch or evidence item is placed inside of. And are all these items that are, uh, are item numbers bearing the DR number in our case? Yes, they are. Now, with respect to the item numbers 47, 50, and 78, did you uh, cause those to be released to someone from the Scientific Investigations Division? Well, they were released in conjunction with a court order. I happened to be present when they were released. And when was that? I'd have to refer to some notes. I, just a moment. It, wasn't that in October? Can we stipulate to the date? It was October 26th. That sound right? The 27th. All right, October 26th. Let's move along. Okay. That was the day of the court order. And, and uh, you would have released them after the court order in October? Well, I didn't release them. They were released by our evidence control unit, but I was present when they were signed right. out. And who were they signed out to? Mr. Regal. Is that the same Mr. Regal that you referred to earlier as a defense expert? Yes. Okay. And at some point, did those come back into the possession of the uh, Scientific Investigations Division? Yes, they did. And can you give us the date on that? That was on March 10th, 1995. Okay, thank you. Back to the testing that you did on the remaining of the items that we haven't discussed. Uh, on this ESD enzyme, the three individuals here have type 1, is that correct? Yes, it is. And why did you use that uh, for the purposes of testing item 49 since everyone has the same ESD type? One of the electrophoretic systems that was used for that item is something that goes by uh, the name of Group 1. It's a group of three different enzymes, the ESD, PGM, and GLO enzymes. Uh, they were all done in conjunction, and all three of them potentially had were available to provide information. And we've already asked you about the results on 13A. Uh, in terms of the PGM subtype, and the EAP result on that was a BA? That's correct. And are both of those types consistent with Nicole Brown? She has the same types, that's correct. And what date did you do this test on 13A? Referring back to my notes. The testing on item 13A, the SOC, was on September 20th, 1994. Now, in order to calculate the frequency on that item, what did you do? I would determine what the frequency of occurrence of 1 plus is in the general population and what the frequency of occurrence or percentage of a BA in the general population and multiply those two numbers together. And is that how you arrived at the 16%? Approximately 16 percent, correct. And w did you do any further testing on this uh, in terms of genetic markers after then? No, I did not. And why? Well, the conventional work at this point was being done strictly to screen certain stains 
to determine whether or not it would be appropriate to send them out for further DNA analysis. And when you're saying at this point, are you talking about September of last year? That's correct. All right. Now, with respect to uh, item number 37, the glove, uh, it has A through D. What does A through D signify? On items, you know, not swatches, but items that have some size, uh, for example, a glove where there may be different bloody areas on it, uh, we'd analyze the different areas that were present. And in this case, I chose four different areas on the glove and designated them as A through D. And what technique did you use? Did you use cloth swatch technique or some other? Well, in this case, I'm, I'm running directly from the glove under the electrophoresis gel, so I would have taken a thread. I described earlier, we showed how you take a thread and put it into the gel. I would have taken a thread and removed the sample uh, directly from the glove. Can you tell us um, which glove uh, A through D, 37A through D, are they all in the same glove or, on they di or are they on different gloves? I'm referring again to my notes. Okay, I chose two samples from the left glove and two samples from the right glove. Excuse me. I took two samples from the front and two samples from the back. <laughs> okay, of one glove? Yes. And what were the results on the uh, test that you performed on item 37, the glove? That I determined the PGM subtype in all four areas tested to be a 2 plus, 1 plus, and the EAP to be inconclusive. And what is a 2 plus, who is a 2 plus, 1 plus consistent with? Of the three people that are mentioned here, it's consistent with Mr. Goldman or anybody else who's a 2 plus, 1 plus. And did you also calculate a frequency for that item? Yes, I did. How did you do that? I determined off of our experience within our laboratory with the PGM subtypes, about 20% of the general population has that type. Okay. And uh, now directing your attention to item 44. Let's just see where that came from if it's on the, uh, on the board. We can move that over a little bit. Did you do some test? some testing on item 44. Yes, I did. Do you see the photograph signifying 44 in the upper right hand uh, corner? One photograph to the left of 45. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Fertlow. You could put that back. Up. I just wanted to. Sorry. Uh, and what were the results on item 44? You're testing on that item. I found the PGM subtype to be a 2 plus 1 plus, and the EAP gave no activity. Did you calculate a frequency? Yes, I did. What, what did you calculate? That a 2 plus 1 plus exists in about 20% of the population. And now let's skip over to uh, item 78B. Did you uh, do some testing on that item? Yes, I did. And at this time, I'd like to mark as people's next in order. It's uh, 2.22, a laboratory note that's L381. All right, 2.22. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Councils.
Mr. Matheson, I'm going to show you this laboratory note and have you describe for us whether you recognize that document and what it is. Yes, I do. That is a copy of a serology item description notes that describes where items were taken off of item number 78, the boots. And what items did you take off of the boots? Well, I tested six different areas uh, on the boots themselves. They were labeled 78A through 78E. And does this chart show the relative locations of uh, A through E? Yes, it does. Did you take swatches off of both boots? Yes. So A came off which boot? 78A is from the sole heel area of the right right boot. And where did 78B come from? 78B is from the outer edge of the sole of the right boot. Is that the same same right boot? I yes. mean, as, as as the other one. As same item number. As 78A, yes. And I'd like to show you some photographs that we previously marked. Your Honor, I don't know whether, yeah. I think they're uh, people's 98. Does this appear to be consistent with, or does this appear to be the, the uh, boot that you took some of the items off, the left one? Or the right one, rather. As I say, that looks like the right yeah. boot, yes. Okay, can you tell us using this photograph and your diagram where you took 78A off of? Yes. 78A would have been collected from the lower heel area down in here, uh, pointing to the lower left-hand bottom of the... Maybe we can mark that. Is, is the arrow in the right position? Mr. Mathens, why don't you look at your mo monitor yeah. here? Uh, I could probably stand to go up a little bit and then towards the right a little bit, right in that general area right there. Can we mark that? Can, you, can, you write a, can we write a 78A or is that too? Sorry, seven, yeah. So that was 78A? Correct. Can we print that? Can you see where 78B came from on this? Not directly, no. Can you give us the general vicinity of it using this photograph? It would be, if you take the arrow up a little bit, Down a little bit and then to the right. No, go back to the edge. It's the sample is actually on the edge of the sole. You can see it directly from the bottom, and in that general area, as is being pointed to by right now. Maybe we can mark that and label that 78A. 78A. I'm sorry. B. B. Yeah. Yes, B. The printout is 223 for identification. All right, people's 223 printout of this uh, photo regarding the boot. Now, Mr. Matheson, continuing with uh, the testing on 78A, excuse me, 78B, the shoe.
Did you have any results on that testing? Yes, on 78B. What was the result? That in the PGM subtype system, I found a 2 plus, 1 plus, and in EAP, there was no activity. What does no activity mean? Well, it means that in that lane on the gel, there was nothing visible, no reaction. And you also calculated a result on that? A frequency, correct. Which was? The same as the other 2 plus 1 plus, it occurs in about 20% of the population. Okay. Now I'd like to uh, direct your attention finally to stain 49. Uh, now, on this particular stain, you, you didn't test this in, in uh, September, but in June? That's correct. And that was on and when in June? The testing was done on June 27th and 28th, 1994. And I'd just like you to look quickly at the uh, Bundy Drive board to see where stain 49 came from. In the uh, left-hand corner, card number 114. Did you test the stain 49 uh, that bear the DR number in this case? Yes, I did. Now, at that time, did it have it had the uh, did it have the item number on it and the photo number one fourteen or don't you know? Referring to my notes, I believe it did. As referenced by my notes, that the item number one correction item number forty nine did have photo ID number one fourteen on it. All right. Now, with respect to this particular stain, did you do ABO typing? On yes. that stain? Yes, I did. And what result did you get off the ABO typing on stain 49? That the results were indicative of a type A. And what does the term indicative mean? When you're doing ABO typing, there's two different factors that can indicate what type or what your result is. One of them is the antigen and one is the antibody. Normally, we like to run both tests so that one can confirm the other. If you only run one or if you only get uh, conclusive results in one, we call it indicative of. In this particular case, I chose to limit the amount of sample I use, only analyzed for what's called the ABO antigen, and thus got an indication of a type A. Why do you want to limit the amount of sample that you used on item 49? Well, again, because there are additional tests that could be performed, in particular DNA testing, which potentially could provide much greater discrimination than ABO testing. Now, are there any individuals of the three people that we have reference samples for that are consistent with the type A? Yes. Who's that? Uh, both Mr. Simpson and Nicole Brown. Is there anyone that can be eliminated as a donor of the stain based upon uh, your testing of the ABO type? Yes. Who's that? Mr. Goldman. Now, his type is what? The results I got is it's indicative of a type O. And why is, is it indicative of O for the same reason that you described indicative of A? Well, similar reasons. One of the two tests uh, provided a conclusive result. The other gave an inconclusive result. All right. Now, with respect to the ESD marker, what was the result on that on item 49? Got an indication of a, a result of a type 1 in the ESD system. And that's consistent with everyone? Yes. At least our three individuals here. That's correct. In relation to the population we're talking about here, the three people. Did you also do a PGM subtype? Yes, I did. And based upon the PGM subtype, were you able to exclude anyone from our population of three individuals uh, based on those results? Yes, I was. Who? Based solely on the PGM subtype, I was able to eliminate Mr. Goldman as contributing that blood or uh, Ms. Brown as contributing that blood. And finally, on the uh, EAP system, did you uh, receive a result? Did you get a result on EAP for item number 49? I did not test it for that. And why wasn't EAP tested on this item? Well, the 
we did not run a system at that time that included the EAP, and we chose to do the PGM subtype solely by itself. So if you had wanted to test EAP on this uh, drop 49, would have you had to use more sample and made a separate run? At this point, yes. And why not do that? The same thing. We don't want to consume any more sample. All right. Now, with respect to the other EAP tests, did you testify that you didn't actually have to use additional sample in order to get those results? That's correct. Now, based upon the testing that you did on item number 49, could that drop have been donated by uh, Nicole Brown? No, it could not. Or by Ronald Goldman? No, it could not. Could have it been donated by Orenthal Simpson? It could have. Now, did you do a calculation of frequency on this blood drop? Yes, I did. And can you break it down for us, starting with the ABO, what the uh, frequency is of that item? I'd have on each individual marker. Can you do that? I can. I'd have to refer to another chart that I made. Okay. Excuse me, that has it combined. I have a chart that breaks down the population frequencies as determined within our laboratory on samples that we have run on just the markers that we are interested in on, on the items in this case. Now, with respect to the um, ABO type, what frequency did you apply to the ABO type on 49? Type A in the ABO system exists in about approximately 33.7% of the general population. So it's just a little over a third. Approximately, yes. Now. With respect to the ESD, the, the um, esterase D result, did you use any figure uh, assigned to that number for the purposes of arriving at your final conclusion? Yes, I did. And what was the percentage there? That the ESD1 exists in about 79.6% of the population. What about PGM subtype? Did you come up with a figure for the PGM subtype? Yes, I did. What was that? That the PGM subtype of a 2 plus, 2 minus exists in approximately 1.6% of the population. So based upon PGM subtype alone, only 1.6% of the population have the same PGM subtype as the defendant in this case? That's correct. Now, in order to come up with your uh, final conclusion in terms of the frequency, what did you do as to item number 49? I took those three percentages that were just mentioned and multiplied them together. And you arrived at what? Simply multiplying together, it comes up with uh, approximately 0.43% of the population which then rounding that off to make it a little bit more understandable works out to about one person out of every 200. Or 0.5 percent. That's correct. And 0.5 percent is one half of one percent? Yes. Does that mean that 99.5 percent of the population can be excluded as having donated that sample? 49, the crime scene? Approximately, yes. Or that if you took 200 people and tested them, that you would expect that only one of them might have the same blood type 
as the person that donated that drop. Oh, well, that's correct. No further questions. Later. You need a moment or do you want to? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a, a brief moment to recycle, reorganize the exhibits and things. Uh, we'll take about uh, 10 or 15 minutes to allow council to do that. I'll ask you just to step back into the jury room and we'll call you out as soon as we're ready to start up again. Mr. Gregory Matheson is again on the witness stand under oath. Now to begin cross-examination by Mr. Blasier. Mr. Matheson, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mr. Matheson, I want to start by asking you some questions about your background that you had testified to on direct. Um, you indicated that uh, you had attended several courses in DNA technology, and I believe your testimony went to the year 1990. Am I accurate on that? I'd have to confirm the uh, dates on that. You mean 1990 is a formal course on the most recent end? That's the last entry that I have uh, concerning DNA training. As far as coursework, yes. And that was a, uh, a two-week course in 1990 in Denver, Colorado, as well as a, a course at Cetus Corporation? Well, the PCR workshop was actually the University of New Haven that was sponsored by Cetus. And it was at that conference that you learned a little bit about RFLP and something about PCR. Vegas to something in a little bit. Overall. Which one are we talking about? The the, the one the one week CETUS course was uh, a fairly involved course on PCR. We actually did uh, the typing ourselves and that type of thing. Uh, the two week course that I mentioned at Denver was a overview of RFLP type techniques along with having a chance to try some of them. And then in 1990, you had the other two courses, the Denver course and the CETUS course? That's what I was just referring to, right, The New Haven course was an earlier course. No, the, uh, there was actually a couple at New Haven. Okay. Since 1990, have you attended any training courses in DNA technology? Not coursework, no. And have you uh, done any re reading on DNA technology since 1990? Yes. What sorts of readings? I've uh, reviewed some uh, technical articles. Uh, as far as just reading goes, I uh, looked through, you know, the different uh, journals that are out there, Journal of Forensic Science Society, that type of thing. Not a lot in depth. Now, there are regular seminars uh, every year put on by Roche Molecular puts some on, and other organizations put on seminars concerning uh, DNA technology and advances that are being made in that area, correct? That's correct. And those courses are available to you if you choose to attend them? Yes, and if I'm given time from the city. And you have not chosen to attend any of those courses? Well, when I said yes, I was re you, you mentioned seminars? Yes. Oh, yes, I've actually attended uh, a couple since 1990 along that line, seminar. When I, when I was talking before about no coursework after 1990, I was talking about a classroom type of setting. Uh, as a matter of fact, in... Um, 1993 in September, I attended a Promega meeting uh, or the International Symposium on Human Identification in Scottsdale, Arizona. And that would be one that was directly related, you know, strictly to the area of DNA. I also attended, like I mentioned, the CAC seminars and the American Academy meetings, which tend to go into uh, length in the area of DNA. Have you ever taught? Uh, any aspect of DNA technology at any of those seminars? No, I have not. Have you ever taught DNA technology at any program at all? Depends on what you mean by DNA technology. I give general overviews, in particular within our department, to detectives so that they're aware of our current status and that type of thing, but not at any of the seminars. Now, you indicated that uh, you're a member of the California Association of Criminalists. 
That's correct. And you've attended every seminar of theirs um, since 1979? Except for either three or four, yes. Now, how often are those held? Twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. And again, are those voluntary programs that you can choose to go to or not choose to go to? Yes, that's correct. And are those, uh, does your organization uh, allow you to attend those if you want to? They will give us time to attend. They don't cover expenses normally. Uh, to your knowledge, uh, has Dennis Fung attended any of those courses? Calls for hearsay. Vague. It's also irrelevant to this, to be honest. Any of those courses, that's vague. I'm sorry? That's vague, any of those courses. The California Association of Criminalist Seminars that happen twice a year, do you have that in mind? Yes. And to your knowledge, did Dennis Fung attend any of those seminars this year? Well, this year, meaning 1995, there hasn't been one yet. 94. Let's see. I'm not sure. The one in the fall was in Pasadena. I, I think I might have seen him there, but I'm not sure. 93. I don't have any specific recollection of whether he's attended or not. Is there a record kept somewhere of who attends various seminars? Normally, it's included, if they choose to include it, as part of their statement of qualifications or CV. Uh, beyond that, uh, our department requires something that's called a travel authority. If it's going to be travel for training purposes or seminars out of the county, and it would be recorded in that, but uh, it's not like a listing of, of individual attendances. And it's, uh, they're not required to keep a record of how many courses they attend or what types of courses they are? Well, it's recommended that they are and that they keep their statement of qualifications up to date. So is it your experience that had he attended courses, that would be on his CV? It should be, yes. Do you know whether Andrea Mazzola has attended any California Association of Criminalist Seminars? No. You don't know or she hasn't? No, I do not. No. Now, do you make any effort to monitor what sorts of classes or seminars the people that work under you attend? Well, we make sure that we give people the opportunity to attend if they are interested, and we try and encourage people to attend. Uh, as far as myself monitoring what courses each individual person goes to, no. Now, you indicated, I believe, that you're a member of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences? Yes, just recently. Now, you're, you're, um, the activity where you are a uh, member of the Board of Directors, that's the California Association of Criminalists? Where I was a member of the Board of Directors, yes, that and the American Board of Criminalistics. Now, with both of those organizations, were you involved in accreditation programs? I was a, neither one of those organizations are involved in accreditation. They are both associated to some extent with certification. Now, describe what certification is. Certification is a system whereby, in our case, it's a voluntary system, whereby a, a professional has an opportunity to show that they meet minimum qualifications of standards within a certain area, as opposed to accreditation in forensics, which tests whole laboratories or laboratory systems. So certification is for an individual, accreditation is for the lab as a whole. That's correct. And is your understanding that within the forensic community, the idea of certification is an important one? It is with many of the members, yes. And there's been a substantial amount of controversy in the forensic community about how forms of certification should take place. Are you aware of that? Whole world. Well, during the course, particularly during the course of when I was involved in setting up the CAC certification program, there was a lot of discussion amongst our members as to what the criteria should be to be able to apply. Uh, there, yeah, there was give and take on that. There was some uh, differences of opinion. And then when we got involved in the American Board of Criminalistics, which is a national body, that because of the wide nature of the different people involved also uh, indicated that there was a difference of opinion in a lot of the different areas. And is it accurate to say that certification programs are designed to ensure that the people who work in this field are competent? 
Well, I'm not sure it really ensures anything. What it does, it gives an indication that a person meets a minimum level of competence through testing, uh, particularly a written test. It's a method to weed out people who might not be competent from people who are competent. Is that accurate? Vegas to weed out. Or will. It's, it is a, well, the fact that it's voluntary, I'm not sure it would weed somebody out because if somebody feels they are not going to meet the standard, they may choose not to uh, apply for it or they may choose not to apply for it just because they don't believe in it or for whatever variety of reason. I think it's just an opportunity for an individual that wants to show that they meet the minimum standards to take the test and apply and, and demonstrate that. Now, there is no governmental body that regulates crime labs, is there? No, there's not. There's no governmental body that regulates criminalists? No, except for in one area. There is uh, some regulation when it comes to blood alcohol analysis. Now, you're familiar with uh, blood banks uh, that draw people's blood to do routine blood testing? Generally, yes. And you're aware that they're heavily regulated by the government? I know that there are regulations, yes. And there are regulations about proficiency testing of people who work in those labs to make sure they don't make mistakes. Not relevant. No, Sustained. Now, there is no such governmental regulation of quality control, for instance, in crime labs, is there? No, there is not. And there is no required qualifications uh, set forth by the government for people to be a criminalist? No, there isn't. That's why the associations entered the area. Now, the associations entered the area because there was a need for such programs. Would you agree with that? Yes. And there's a need for that type of program to ensure the quality of criminalistics work that's done by criminalists, correct? Well, we're going back to the word ensure. I'm not sure that just by offering a program like this that it will ensure that this will occur, I, particularly the fact that it is voluntary. Well, that's the idea, though, isn't it? The, it, that's correct. The idea is for the people that uh, are competent to demonstrate that they are. Now, how many different informal, involuntary, I'm sorry, voluntary <laughs> certification programs are there? Well, right now there is actually only one, and that would be the one that's sponsored by the American Board of Criminalistics. The program that the California Association of Criminalists, or the CAC, put into place was in essence folded into or melded into the American Board of Criminalistics program. We didn't want competing systems out there. Now, has Dennis Fung applied for certification? I don't know. Has Andrea Mazzola applied for any form of certification? I don't know. Are the people that work in your division encouraged to apply, to apply for certification? It's, yes, we make sure that they know that they, it's something that they can do and are welcome to do if they like. Do you make any effort to track the people that work for you in terms of whether they've applied for certification and been certified? <clears throat> Sustain. This goes beyond the scope of the direct. Now, you talked about um, the Denver course, I'm sorry, the uh, New Haven course was taught by, among other people, Henry Lee. One of the courses at New Haven, yes. And Henry Lee, would you agree, is one of the world's foremost forensic scientists? He is very well known and qualified, yes. And he's the director of the Connecticut State Police Crime Lab, correct? My understanding, yes. And he works primarily for prosecutors? I believe he works for the system. I, I suppose, in general, yes, they do tend to work for the prosecutors. And you're aware that he's an expert for the defense in this case? That's my understanding, yes. Uh, tell us what ASCLAD is. ASCLAD stands for the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors. And that's an organization that uh, also has, or does have, an accreditation program for crime labs, correct? Well, they started 
the what I believe is the only accreditation program for crime laboratories. That organization now is a separate body from ASCLAD called ASCLAD Lab. I'm sorry, ASCLAD Lab or <laughs> laboratory. And the function of that, or one of the functions of that organization, is to go examine a crime lab, make recommendations, see whether they meet minimum standards in order to perform services as a crime lab. Correct? That's correct. And how long has that program been in effect? I believe it's been about seven, eight years. Not quite sure. Did you have uh, participate in any way in setting up that program? No, not at all. Are you aware of the requirements for accreditation? I have read the uh, handout they have, yes. Do your understanding that the requirements for accreditation are basically standards, minimum standards, that a lab should meet in order to qualify for accreditation? Yes, that's true. And those standards are supposed to be minimum standards that would be used by a crime lab and criminalists that work for a crime lab in doing their work. It's, it's a goal to attain those, yes. And you're, you're familiar with the particular guidelines that ASCLAD has set forth in order for a lab to be accredited? I've read them. I haven't, don't have them memorized. Do you think they are good guidelines? Well, it's better it's good. Or will. As a rule, yes. And do you think that the guidelines that are set out by ASCLAD are desirable for a crime lab to follow? Within the criteria they have, in other words, delineating which are essential, let's see, it's essential, necessary, I forget what the three terms are, but it allows you to, to meet certain portions of each of those and only all of the essential ones. Now, I believe you indicated on your direct testimony that you have not, or LAPD has not applied for accreditation for lack of funding? That's the major reason, yes. And the, it's your understanding that the funding required is what? I don't know the exact number. I've been told that the possibility of the cost for our, a laboratory of our size could run anywhere from ten to $30,000. Have you, has your lab ever applied for accreditation? Well, we can't apply until the city authorizes the expenditure of the money, and we have requested that money to be made available to us. Is it fair to say that you've been one of the, the movers to try and get accreditation for your lab? Uh, not to this point, no, because that the accreditation is, it was more on a managerial level, and up until just four months ago, I was not at that level. I was at a supervisory level. And though I feel that it's something that we should be attaining, it was our managers at the time that were pushing for it. Are they still pushing for it? Yes, at this point we are. It's considered to be something that's important to your lab? Yes. Now, is it your opinion that your current practices, many of which you've described here today, meet the minimum standards of ASCLAD? Not relevant. Sustain. Do you have a quality manual at SID? We currently have one that is being developed. We do not have one that is complete. What is that called? The manual itself? Yes. Well, it's being compiled by our uh, quality control, quality assurance manager. I'm sure at some point it will be named well, like quality control manual or something. I don't believe it has a name at the moment. Is that the field manual that there's been testimony about? No, it is not. So the field manual is some different document? That's correct. What is that? The field manual is a guideline, general protocol and procedures manual that was being compiled by the trace analysis field unit supervisor as guidelines on how we should operate in the field. How long has that been under development? I believe it was it was probably started about three to four years ago, but actual work on the manual stopped when that uh, particular supervisor uh, resigned and moved to another laboratory. Now, 
Is there any other manual that you have in SID that your criminalists are required to follow? Not relevant. Oral. Well, most of the units have product, protocol and procedure manuals within the unit. Is there a protocol and procedure manual for the field unit? Not at this point. That's the one that we just referenced that's under development. Do the materials in the field manual, in your opinion, uh, set forth standards that should be followed by the criminalists that work for SID? At this point, it's been a while since I've reviewed the whole thing. I do know that there is some information in there that is outdated that needs to be updated. In general, the information is good, but that's one reason why it has not been presented to the lab, because it has not had a chance to be updated and managerially, managerially reviewed. Now, I want to ask you some questions about the, the required training for criminalists at SID. Um, I think you indicated the, the minimum educational requirements are a Bachelor of Science in some sort of science. In a science, that's correct. And is there any additional training other than the mini academy that we've been talking about that criminalists are required to take in order to work for SID? Are you talking about once they're on the job or prior to being hired? Well, let's talk about prior first. Prior to being hired, the only requirement is that they have a, a bachelor's degree in science. And after they're hired, is there any required program that they must attend? Well, there's no required or formally required program except for what we've described as the informal SID Academy. And they're not required to attend any courses outside of SID, is that correct? No, there's no requirement for the people to attend them. We do, there are courses available, and there are certain ones that we do try and get, you know, we get them to fill out applications and submit them to the agencies that offer this training. Uh, and if they're accepted, you know, then we give them time and hopefully resources in order to attend. Now, the, uh, the mini academy, how often is that held? Well, the SID Academy, as it's been called, is kind of an informal structure of a variety of different topics. The goal is to have one every Thursday afternoon, but due to workload considerations and vacations and things like that, many times it's postponed till the next week or the instructor that was supposed to be doing it is on a day off or something. So, like I said, we, just, we shoot for every Thursday afternoon. It doesn't always work out that way. So it's an on-again, off-again type of program? Well, the program's not on again, off again. It, it continues, and we do keep track of who attends what within this uh, program. But you know, as many times that it could be two or three weeks or more uh, before it meets again. Are criminalists required to attend? Criminalist ones are required to attend, and any other criminalist, it's offered to them if they want to. Are they required to keep any kind of uh, manuals, written notes of coursework? <sighs> Oh, well. I don't know about as far as required. You know, it depends on the instructor for a particular module. And the instructors, as a rule, are other more experienced criminalists within the laboratory. If there are handouts that are provided to the criminalists, then they are encouraged to keep them, uh, keep them within their possession so they can refer to them at a later date. Is there some kind of record kept as to who attends various seminars and what the subject matter is? Are we talking about seminars outside of the division or this academy? The academy in the uh, lunchroom area there. Uh, my understanding is they do keep track of who attends them. Do they keep track of what courses have been given for a particular session? Yes. Is there some kind of a compilation of uh, handout material that has been passed out as part of the coursework? I don't believe so, no. Are they given any kind of examinations? I don't believe there's been any written examinations. I do know that uh, in some of the instructors, they work into a, a segment where the person is, if it's a 
To give you an example, a demonstration on casting shoe prints, they will have everybody in the ca class cast a shoe print. But as far as formal examinations, no. So there isn't, I assume there are no grades given out in terms of how well people do or don't do? That's correct. Is there any kind of uh, disciplinary pr procedure that you invoke if someone doesn't attend these? No. I, if somebody does fail to attend, uh, we have their supervisor find out why it is. And if there was no particularly good excuse, and many times people are doing casework or they're going to court or something, so they miss out on one. But if they just fail to attend, then that's noted. And when that subject comes around again, I, they are told to attend that one. Uh, is there instruction ever provided by outside experts? We have occasionally brought in somebody, but it's been more on the area of general uh, police topics. I mean, the, the academy includes not only forensics, but things such as radio procedures and a variety of things like that when you're dealing with a uh, departmental agency like we are. And in those instances, we bring somebody in from the department to do that. How often does that happen? It's not It's this day. Now, you indicated on direct that you offer a training program to detectives in terms of how to collect evidence. Well, the department has a number of very formal courses, among which are detective, uh, homicide detective school, sexual assault detective school, and detective supervisor school. And they always give SID or the crime lab a portion of that so that we can teach the detectives about what you know, forensics is about. And are homicide detectives uh, regularly taught how to collect blood stains? Well, the ones that attend the courses that I teach are, yes. They're provided kits to collect blood stains, are they not? If they request them, yes. So they have access to <clears throat> swatches? Yes. And they have access to coin envelopes and plastic envelopes? Yes. And they have access to tweezers and other tools for making swatches from blood stains? Well, if, if you mean access on all of these items, we have them within our laboratory, and if they run low or if they lose them or they need a replacement, they call us up and we supply them to them. But this is also something that they might have, they might have available to them wherever they happen to be working out of? Oh, well. Oh, well. We supply them, like I mentioned, it's, a, it's basically just a file box with the tools and implements they need to collect these things. And if they were to run out, particularly if they say the cloth swatches, or if they lose their tweezers, or if they lose their scissors, they call us up and ask us for new ones. Now, did I understand you to say <clears throat> that 90% of homicides, it's the detective that processes the scene rather than a criminalist? Well, these are very rough numbers. My guess is that we probably respond to somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of them, yes. And whose decision is it whether a criminalist is going to respond or the police are going to handle the scene themselves? It's the detective that is assigned that case. Do you know what the criterion <clears throat> is for that decision? I don't think there's any uh, defined criteria for it. It's kind of up to the detective if, if they feel that there is evidence there that they want assistance in collecting and they call the crime lab. Now, within SID, uh, at the time of this case on June 13th, your position was what? I was, my position was as a supervising criminalist and the units that I supervised was serology, our trace unit, the field unit, the forensic photographer, and our chemical processing unit. Were you the supervisor for Dennis Fung and Andrea Mazzola during the time they processed the crime scene in this case? <sighs> Not directly, no. Uh, they both worked in different units. I suppose indirectly in that field services at that point, at least during the daytime, were part of my responsibility, but not directly, no. Who was their direct supervisor? <clears throat> well, in the case of Dennis Fung, his supervisor is Doreen Music at the firearms unit, and for Andrea Mazzola, her supervisor is uh, Bernie Sanchez in toxicology. 
but when they get called out to a scene, uh, do they still report to the same supervisors, or is it there one person who's knowledgeable about crime scene investigations that they report to as to that aspect of their job? Well, as a rule, they have some autonomy out there. If they needed some assistance, uh, normally at that point, uh, they are advised to call one of the uh, assistant directors or the director of the laboratory. Is it fair to say it's pretty much up to them whether they call for additional assistance or not? As to whether or not they say they need additional assistance, yes. So there's no one that's directly overseeing them to check with them to see if they need help. It's it's pretty much just in response to a request by them. As a rule, yes. I mean, many times the field calls come in in the middle of the night, and as a supervisor, I may not even know that it occurred until the next day after the person has gone, done their work, and gotten back to the laboratory. Now, Steve Johnson, uh, who is he? He is the other assistant director, director of the laboratory. Now, he was present at the crime scenes on June 13th, was he not? Yes, he was. Were you present at those scenes? No, I was not. When Steve Johnson was present, what was his function? If you know. Oral. If you know. He was responding as assistant director, along with the captain of our division. Both of them were out there to uh, see how things were going, to do a quick overview of the scene, and provide assistance if necessary. If not, uh, to return back to the laboratory. Now, you indicated that the captain of your division, the person that is over the lab director is a police captain, correct? That's correct. Do the people that work for SID carry badges? We are issued Scientific Investigation Division badges, yes. And, uh, But the, the, the criminalists are considered civilian employees of the police department? Yes. What was Michelle Kessler's position as of June 13th? Not normal. On June 13th, she was one of the assistant directors of the laboratory. At that time, we did not have a director. That spot was empty. She and Mr. Johnson uh, shared the responsibility for administration of the laboratory. And she is now the director of the lab? That's correct. Now, she's married to a robbery homicide detective, is she not? Yes, she is. Uh, does she work fairly closely with uh, detectives in the police department, to your knowledge? Well, to some extent, we all do. I don't think she does any more than the rest of us, other than the fact she's married to one. Do you know whether she socializes with detectives in robbery homicide? I was, We're getting beyond the scope of the director here, Council. Now, you indicated on direct that you were in charge of managing <clears throat> items in this case. Do you remember that testimony? I believe so, yes. What did you mean by that? Well, one of the roles that I've had is in coordinating an awful lot of the activities when it comes in tracking what happens in uh, analysis in relation to this case. Every time that uh, requests for analysis have gone through me, requests to have the evidence submitted outside have gone through me if I've been available, uh, the times where we have set up viewings for the defense, uh, I've been mainly involved in that, making sure the items were available and that the areas were available and that type of thing. Just general coordination. And have you uh, had that function since the beginning of the case? Pretty much, yes. Has it been your responsibility <clears throat> to uh, track all of the items of evidence that have been collected from the 13th onward? What do you mean by track? Keep track of where they are. No, it is not. Has it been your job to determine what items of evidence are to be analyzed and what aren't to be analyzed? Well, like I mentioned, most of the requests go through me as a, a contact point for the detectives 
or the DA's office, they would call me up to put in the request specifying what type of analysis was re requested to be done. I would then prepare a request and forward it on to the appropriate person. Now, have you been monitoring since June 13th the uh, media coverage about this case? Off and on, yes. And have you been following the court proceedings? Off and on. When you say off and on, what do you mean? Well, I would watch some, and there got to be a point a while back where I figured it was probably best not to. It just it was consuming too much of my time during the day. Uh, I tended to be paying more attention to it once people within our laboratory were involved. At what point did you stop watching television? Well, during the daytime, that would be during the detective's testimony. Now, did you watch the testimony of Dennis Fung? as much as I could. I still am working, so I'd be in and out of my office and I miss segments of it. Did you try to watch the testimony of Andrea Mazzola? Same thing, as much as possible. And that was with a television in your office? Yes. Did you discuss their testimonies with them in the evenings after they testified? <laughs> Let me start with Dennis Fung. From the time that Mr. Fung started testifying until he was done, I only, I left messages on his answering machine twice, uh, didn't talk directly with him, and I met with him one evening and we went out to dinner, and that was it. During Andrea Mazzola's testimony, did you have any conversations or meet with her when she wasn't testifying? I believe there was uh, one meeting that we had, it was myself, uh, Michelle Kessler and Colin Yamuchi and Ms. Mazzola in Ms. Kessler's office. When was that? Oh, I don't know the exact date. It was sometime, uh, I believe, early on in her testimony. And what was the subject matter of that meeting? We were just talking generally about uh, style of testimony, uh, how to feel comfortable on the stand, uh, posing questions to her as far as potential things that uh, she might be asked about. So you talked about specific issues that might come up as part of her testimony. We didn't so much talk about them, just as suggest areas that she may want to be aware of as far as uh, potential questions that may be applied to her. What sorts of areas did you suggest to her might come up? Hmm. Sustain. Did Michelle Kester participate in that meeting? Sustain. Was there any specific discussion of item 17, Mr. Simpson's blood vial, at that meeting? Oh, well. Oh, I don't remember that item. If that item specifically came up, it might have. Were you aware that that was a significant issue or had been raised as a significant issue by the defense by that time? Yes. And. Was the purpose of that meeting to discuss that issue, among others? No, it wasn't. You have no recollection of whether you discussed that or not with her? Oh, I don't remember if we discussed that specific item. Like I said, we were talking generally about style and just how to testify, feeling comfortable about testifying. When you say how to testify, what do you mean? Just, I'm... So young, so... Mildly, one answer. Go ahead and answer the question, then we're going to quit for the day. The concept of, of trying to be comfortable, to uh, you know, make eye contact, that type of thing, to deal with the attorneys and the jury, uh, the whole process of being in a courtroom and testifying. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our uh, recess for the afternoon. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves. Don't form any opinions about the case. Do not conduct any deliberations until the matter has been submitted to you. Do not allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. We'll see you back here tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock. Uh, we'll stand in recess for five minutes, and I'd like to see counsel again. Thank you. All right, Mr. Matheson, uh, tomorrow morning, 8.45.
so I've seen it the night before, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it appears that there are a number of things in the exhibits that I just got this afternoon that are objectionable. I don't want to go through it in detail because Mr. Matheson is here in the court. Uh, said that I can't discuss it with them. All right, Mr. Uh, Matheson, uh, do you need Mr. Matheson anymore this afternoon? Um, I don't think so. All right, Mr. Matheson, why don't you excuse us? Thank you. All right, Mr. Goldberg. As to the, the court's or, uh, order that we not show or discuss the materials to the to the uh, witness, Mr. Matheson. Uh, I'd also like the court to perhaps revisit that in light of what the materials are, because many of them do not at all appear to be impeachment. They're not impeachment. They're just things the defense wants to ask him about. And some of them, it's very difficult to figure out exactly what they mean. Uh, well, let's take it from the top. What are they? What They don't have numbers on them, so I'll, I'll take them in that. The order which I was uh, handed them. One of them appears to be a block type diagram showing the electrophoresis plates on uh, items 84 A and B. I can't tell exactly what this is supposed to be. So whether is this the full slides or is this the whole? Order? No, these are uh, power. What are called PowerPoint slides that are projected over the computer system. Each, there are six of those per page. Actually, each one takes up the whole screen. Uh, those are scanned pictures that we've been provided by the prosecution of the electrophoretograms for the fingernails and, and some other items. But there's also a block diagram as well. And I, I can't really read these electrophoretograms. They, they may be, as counsel says, I'm sure they are, uh, pictures of what we uh, already provided. But I can't see that based on what I've been handed. Mm -hmm. Um, and, All right, and this then when thing, do we have those available? Does Mr. Harris have those available on his computer? Yes. All right. I did. Can you hold that by Mr. Harris, how, how long or far away are they? So right here, I just disconnected. Okay. How, how long will it take you to boot back up? I'm sorry? About 10 minutes. Get them on. I have them on my computer. I'd be happy to, my screen's a little small, but I'd be happy to bring it back to Chambers and show everybody. Mr. Goldberg? Well, perhaps we need to do that, because I would like to verify that. But in addition, the diagram also contains what appear to be some block diagrams. This would require Mr. Matheson to take a close look at it in order to compare it to the actual electrophoretogram to see whether the block diagram is more or less accurate. So I don't see any reason that that would have to be done on the witness stand. And I'm not, I, I, I really can't address this in further detail myself because I don't have the level of expertise that's necessary to figure out exactly what's going on here in the block diagrams. All right. What else is there besides the diagrams and the uh, photographs of the uh, electrophoresic uh, on like, that particular one? Yeah. That, what else that's, is? that's a, a full description of it and, and, our, and the issues that pertain to that item. All right. Is that all as, of these? As I understand it. But, but understand that I have not, never asked Mr. Matheson about the block diagram. Sorry. Is that all there is? Photographs and these diagrams? It looks like there are two photographs at the top and uh, four diagrams underneath it. All right. You seem to have several sheets. Is that what they are? No, uh, there, there are a variety of different things. All right, what else? This is all part of the same group, the same presentation. All right, well, uh, I'll, I'm dealing with the EAP ones first, and then some of them deal with different issues. There's a block diagram of, it says, when BA degrading stands to secure from top down. My understanding is that that is not true based upon my own reading of, of the scientific literature and my discussions with Mr. Matheson. Uh, and then there's some charts here that says that a uh, degraded BA only has one B band as opposed to two B bands. And I'm only aware of a footnote in one article that somewhat supports this view. But this is the kind of thing, again, where in order to be able to intelligently answer this issue, Mr. Matheson might want to go back and look at that one footnote and also some of the other articles. 
and also determine whether or not these block diagrams are correct. You know, that, you know and, and I'm not really qualified to do that. I, I would suggest I will give Mr. Matheson every article that I intend to refer to. I'll give that to you now so that he can review them for tomorrow. All right. But, but what, he's, what he's suggesting may not be scientifically correct, and, and um, I don't, don't object to as putting something up on the screen for which there will never be any foundation way of not reached to Matheson or any defense expert. Well, count, this, counsel's offering to give this to you at this point. What, what's the identity of the articles, Mr. Blazer? These are all articles on EAP systems. Um, do you want me to identify them on the record? Yeah, just so we know what you're giving. One is uh, Dr. George Sensabaugh, and the title is The Utilization of Polymorphic Enzymes in Forensic Science. There's a second article by Dr. Sensabaugh, Isoenzymes in Forensic Science. There's an article by Brian Raxall and Elizabeth Eames, E-A-M-E-S, Erythrocyte Acid Phosphatase in Blood Stains. There's a technical note by T.E. Yeshion, Y-E-S-H-I-O-N, titled Thermal Degradation of Erythrocyte Acid Phosphatase Isoenzymes in Case Sample. I read that. <laughs> and finally, I believe, is an article by Jill Luffman and Harry Harris titled A Comparison of Some Properties of Human Red Cell Acid Phosphatase in Different Phenotypes. All right. All right, and Mr. Blazer, what else besides the photographs and the block charts, what else, what other exhibits are you going to be using? I had one other uh, series of charts, or I'm sorry, series of slides to demonstrate how many swatches you can make from a milliliter of blood. And the third one is... Well, I, I, can I continue going through this, Your Honor? No, I'm just asking, since Mr. Blazier knows what they are and you don't appear to know precisely what they are because of what you have, I well, thought it would be more precise for me to ask Mr. Blazier what they are. And the third one is uh, uh, some slides that I wish to go through with Mr. Matheson on security at uh, SID. It has, a, it has a couple of pictures that I think have already been introduced. Oh, I, I also yeah, may be using some of the boards that were used in the opening statement. I probably will be, but they've seen those, certainly. All right. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, did the court want me to continue with the EAP? Well, I mean, basically the, the overriding objection to all of the EAP-type slides is that in order to show these, he's going to have to have some foundation for it. And if no one's ever talked to Mr. Matheson about this to determine whether he is going to support it, mm -hmm. and there is no defense witness, obviously, that's going to testify in the people's case to support it, then these should never come in. And many of them do contain statements that appear to be argumentative, that appear to be inconsistent with my understanding of the scientific literature and also what Mr. Matheson's views are. Um, so I, you're, you're, objecting, to, you're objecting to some of the titles? Well, that's a, a generic objection that, that relates to all of the EAP materials. And then I had specific objections on the first one, which I described as being the uh, one with the electrophoretogram photographs. I have an objection to the second diagram that says, when a BA degrades, bands disappear from the top down, as, as not reflecting my understanding of the way it works, uh, and as being argumentative. The second diagram is similar to that. It seems to be an illustration of the principle. Excuse me, the third diagram appears to be an illustration of the principle of the second diagram. All right, let's do this, counsel. I have a meeting at 5.30 I have to attend. I'm going to order all counsel who are involved in this, Mr. Goldberg and Mr. Blazer. I'm going to order you both to be here at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning with Mr. Harris. And let's fire these things up. Let's look at them in real, real size and see what's there. All right, and Mr. Uh, I assume, Mr. Goldberg, you have other experts uh, assisting the prosecution other than Mr. Uh, Matheson that you can consult with with regards to these items over the evening hour. Well, we do, but unfortunately, some of that uh, no, some of them may not be in town. 
So if we were to uh, consult one of our experts who is a serologist, that would be difficult to do between now and 8 a.m. or so. 8 a.m. All right, and we'll, uh, Mr. Harris, we'll fire those up. We'll take a look at them. We'll go through them one at a time. Yeah. And is the prosecution still under order, so not to discuss these or show this with Mr. Matheson? Yes. Yeah, I, I, in, in light of the discussion, I have no objection. In fact, I want them to go over them with Mr. Matheson. All right. All right. See you tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock. And that does, does not include the court reporter. Yes. Take your day less than tomorrow. Oh. No, and don't forget at four o'clock we have That's what I'm talking three about. motions. Yeah, I, I filed um, a short letter of memorandum in response. To the, I'm sorry, I'm I'm sorry. I, I filed a short letter memorandum in response to the uh, prosecution's parody uh, response, and I've been telling Mr. Harmon uh, that uh, in with with respect to his motion, all that we have uh, are two declarations, one of which I've finally been able to track down from Dr. Readers, uh, who'd been ill, that I've given to them, and I'll, I'll file with the court. It's one page, five paragraphs. And the other one I'm seeking, uh, I know it's substance, is uh, Mr. Uh, Salop, Salop, I'm going to mispronounce uh, Carl's name, uh, Salopka, who uh, I think is the we, we believe must be the individual who spoke with Agent Marks at this meeting in Seattle who is named in Mr. Harmon's response. My suggestion to him, and he's free to take it if he wants, is that uh, there are conflicts, factual conflicts, uh, and uh, I don't uh, particularly see the need until he gets an opportunity to talk with these individuals and get declarations from them if they want uh, to settle the record to deal with it tomorrow. Maybe we could, I know we have another day when Mr. Uh, Dean Ullman's coming down the ninth in light of the court's ruling this morning uh, uh, with respect to uh, consumption. Uh, you know, I, I have concerns about the issue, but uh, I don't think it's of uh, pressing need given the way we're going to handle that. So that's just a uh, I think a friendly invitation to him to settle the record on paper and to uh, try to keep it tight. Uh, he's free to accept it or not. Mr. Harmon. Uh, you know, Judge, I think this is real curious. Remember when they filed this, there was a big rush to get this resolved. Remember that? I think they filed it on a Thursday and Mr. Neufeld got up and said, this is really urgent. We need to get this resolved. So I spent the weekend filing the response. We filed it on that Tuesday morning, as, and, and then it was set, and then, and then other things came up. So the short answer is you decline the invitation, and you're willing to go well, forward Well, I, it be, it be, I, I just find it fascinating that these declarations just suddenly show up on the eve of the hearing, and then one of them's lost somewhere in the stratosphere, and, and the hearing has been set for tomorrow afternoon. You know, I want to get this black cloud off my head that, that they've planted over there. But, you know, this is very typical, as I referred to in, in my response to the way they operate. So, um, All right, I take that Your as Honor, a no. Well, I guess he's saying no, but I guess that, I take that as a no. I tried. All right. I tried. We'll take a brief recess at 4 o'clock tomorrow, and then we'll launch into uh, a half hour's worth of motions. All right, see you all tomorrow, and uh, Mr. Blazier, Mr. Goldberg, 8 o'clock tomorrow.